Right, now that we're, we're correct, we'll, sorry. Now that we're correct, we'll, we'll actually start the meeting. So there's, there are two more to attend. We've been at the, um, the uh, conference this morning. Uh, first of all, apologies. We've got apologies from Susan Howarth, Daniel Meredith, and Charles Rigby. Um, Charles, I know, was a, a very late cry off, uh, after a hospital appointment, which I hope, I hope is okay. Um, and we've got Ray Dutton standing in the substitute yet again. So thank you for that. Uh, chair's announcements and urgent business. Um, first of all, item number six, the work and skills update. Uh, with your permission, I'd like to take that as item number nine at the end. Are you happy with that? Thank you. And then the other thing is that we did say that uh, you know, on a regular basis we would have a, a Brexit update. So now that Simon is hot footed as well, across from the same conference, uh, if, if you gr yep. gr grasp your breath, your breath over to you, Simon. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I guess uh, I don't want to say too much about um, Brexit uh, per se in terms of where we are in terms of negotiations, etc., because uh, obviously that's a very, uh, very much a, a moving feast. Um, <clears throat> what we uh, do know in terms of the, the Brexit monitor that uh, we've been um, looking at on an ongoing basis um, is that actually we're not seeing quite the slowdown in the economic performance that you might have expected, but we do know that a large part of that is due to the fact that companies are definitely stockpiling, um, and there's quite a lot of evidence of that, um, and therefore we believe that the economy is effectively being kept artificially uh, higher than it might otherwise be because of that, that factor. Um, so obviously that, that um, uh, will uh, we'll continue to monitor that and see, see what happens over the next few weeks and months. Um, obviously, we did the economic uh, impact analysis uh, that was reported to the, to the combined authority. I thought the thing I just would focus on a, a little bit, though, was on, on preparations for Brexit, um, and particularly preparations for, for a no-deal Brexit. Um, and, and just to say, I guess, uh, in that, and this is a report that's going to uh, corporate resources scrutiny uh, next week, um, but there is a range of work going on around uh, trying to understand or trying to, to engage with government about uh, Brexit. It and, and, and where things, uh, where, where impacts might be felt. There is a range of work going on around uh, civil contingencies as well, should that be necessary. Um, we, have, we are pulling together a, a list of infrastructure projects across Greater Manchester where the value is more than £10 million. Uh, the reason for that is just to try and understand whether any of those might be affected by a no-deal Brexit uh, in terms of either a shortage of labour or prices rising or viability of those projects uh, changing. We're working very directly with Manchester Airport in terms of being the, the, the major point of entry into the UK uh, within within Greater Manchester's remit and looking particularly at uh, kind of skills issues um, in, the, in the health sector uh, but also in our other major sectors where we have a large numbers of EU uh, nationals working um, and uh, I've said before you know I think the issue will probably be less about uh, the migration policy that ultimately gets uh, agreed and more about the, uh, the kind of value of the pound and the choice that EU workers make about their future within the UK um, and we're also then encouraging all public sector organisations to look at their uh, organizational readiness so are they as an individual organization ready and I'll say a little bit about that about the combined authority in a second um, and particularly one issue that, that is uh, kind of um, concerning quite a few people is, is kind of data issues because a lot of data is actually stored on servers that are actually outside of the UK uh, and there are all sorts of data issues we just need to make sure that we are uh, preparing for uh, in the event of a no deal. Um, there is a group uh, at a GM level looking at all of that and then there's a group within Greater Manchester Combined Authority also looking at our readiness from an organisational point of view. The major issues um, in, from an organisational point of view are particularly around the fire service uh, as, as part of the combined authority uh, and also waste disposal and what might happen to waste disposal if, if there are problems in, in, uh, exporting uh, waste as a, quite a lot of our waste, uh, is export, plastic waste particularly is exported. So those issues are being looked at um, and all those issues are now in corporate, included within the corporate risk register and as I say the corporate resources committee is looking at that in detail uh, next week. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you Chair. Uh, any questions? Uh, Yvonne first, then Luke. Yes, thank you, Simon. I was, I was interested just about the fire, uh, uh, the fire service. Well, I, I'm sorry, I'm being dense here, but why would that? Why would it have a knock-on? I can see it about the waste, but why would it knock-on with the fire service? 
So uh, a lot of the parts for the fire engines are brought in from abroad um, and also the protective equipment that the firefighters use is, although it's um, sourced from a company uh, in the UK, they source it from, uh, they, the materials that they use to make up the fire protective equipment uh, is actually sourced from outside of the, sorry, the, sorry, the, the company's based in the UK but they source it from, out, from outside of the UK and therefore if there were problems importing from the EU, if there were problems importing, then you could see delays. It's not, a, it wouldn't be a major problem but it would be delays in getting access to that, 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 that issue, and as I say, all of those issues are being looked at uh, seriously across the organisation. Luke. Thank you, and thanks for the update. Um, I suppose whatever happens with Brexit, it's likely to be quite a difficult time economically for the next couple of years. Um, and I know, we, as, as we all know, we don't have much power in the city regions to do anything about that. Um, but I suppose the question is, what power do we have, and are we ready to, to use it? Um, I suppose in terms of sort of pump priming capital expenditure and so on, uh, in terms of perhaps persuading businesses to stay and using personal connections and so on to just um, do whatever we can to mitigate some of the impacts of this. Thank you. Um, I think one of the things we have, um, we're have beginning to touch on um, in our preparations is, is the whole issue of support to businesses and, and to individuals if, if there were to, so if there were a recession and businesses were struggling, how do we support those businesses and if people were being made redundant, how do we support those individuals uh, in a period of redundancy? Obviously we're not, we're not there um, but we need to think about uh, how we would do that and we've got actually got a discussion next week about looking to prepare ourselves for that eventuality. Uh, I think there are two points to make. One, one is we are, we have done this in the past uh, through uh, the previous recession and actually we, we did pull an awful lot of resources together and redirected quite a lot of the growth companies' resources into working with companies who were, um, you know, struggling um, and also to support individuals who were being uh, made redundant or were threatened with redundancy. Um, the other thing is I think obviously and we've got a kind of live conversation with central government about actually what, what, what support might come from central government in those instances and how might we deploy that. The one thing that, that is definitely happening is, is we are being asked to kind of give far more regular reports to government about the state of the economy and, and any issues that, we're, that, that we are um, uh, noticing such that they can then take appropriate action as well. So it's a bit early yet, um, but we are beginning to think about getting ourselves organised for that eventuality. Bob. Thanks, Chair. Um, Sam, I mean, You've got to sort of understand that some people might have some scepticism about forecasters. I mean, your track record is not the greatest in the world. We can go back to the 2000 where we were all going to blow up because the computers couldn't move on and we go on to the Euro and we go on to the actual Brexit vote when the next two years after that we were all going to be damned and sent to hell as, as Mr. Uh, whatever he says, Tuss says. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at your 2.2 here. Um, I mean, you've really gone for it. Um, under a no-deal scenario, the greater Manchester economy, economic growth would be 8.2 billion smaller. Over what period? Um, because that, you, you're saying over, overall over 15 years, everything will be fine. So when does the 8.2... I mean, it sounds like it's going to happen in the first quarter. Um, you know, over what period are we talking about? Um, and, and you go on about even the greater Manchester economic growth will be 5.1 billion smaller. So presumably, over what period? Because in the other paragraph, you're saying over 15 years it won't be. So, so I think the report you're referring to is the corporate resources scrutiny paper on, on, on Brexit. The, basically, the, that analysis in paragraph 2.2 uh, is using the government's own analysis. Um, so literally all we've done is taken the government's analysis and applied it to the Greater Manchester economy. Um, so we're not making any judgment about that analysis. We're just saying, taking the government's own analysis and applying it to Greater Manchester, that's what you would end up with. The, the paragraph, just to be absolutely clear, what we are saying is that the uh, over a 15 year period, under a no-deal scenario, the Greater Manchester economy would be 8.2 billion pounds smaller than if we had stayed in the EU. So we're still seeing there's st there will still be growth in the Greater Manchester economy. It'll still be bigger 15 years later than it is today, but it will be 8.2 billion pounds smaller than if we had stayed in the EU. And that's based on, say, on the government's own analysis. So those those figures are relative to staying in the EU. They're not overall total growth. I'd have to come back to you on that specific percentage, so I can come back to you on that particular point. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, just to be absolutely clear, um, you know, all, all we are doing is we're not we're not 
taking any action at this stage. We're saying if there were to be economic issues following uh, our departure from the EU, if there were to be, then we are you know, we're, we're making sensible preparations for what we as a as a public sector would need to do in order to respond to that. Uh, let me just add to that. I mean, the trouble with the economic forecasts. The only thing you can say, but any degree of certainty, they'll be wrong. You know, wrong in one direction or another direction. And, and I think that you know, Sam is it response is appropriate. And I, I think the other thing as well is clearly, I mean, it's, um, this is, is more a case of looking at this in more detail with, with the Corporate Overview and Scrutiny Committee. And, 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 I, and I think that it's important that we're aware of these things um, for, for obvious reasons, but, but I think the real scrutiny comes out, I know, in the different committee, but I think it's right and proper that we've got an update every, every, you know, well, every meeting, basically. Any more questions or can we pass on? Um, Mary. Um, the news has been full of, of um, companies who are relocating into the EU to prove them against the exit. Um, are we aware of any companies within GM um, that have relocated um, to prepare for the exit scenario? Um, I, I don't, sorry, uh, the growth company would be able to give you more details on that. I can get that for, for you. I'm not aware of any companies that have actually moved yet. Uh, we are aware of some companies, um, and uh, quite a common response is to set up a second operation within Europe. Um, and the question will be over a period of time, the balance of operations between the UK and the rest of Europe, uh, or the or UK and Europe if, uh, or when, when we leave. Um, so it's, it's that, that's quite a common response to say setting up a second operation and not necessarily moving out of the UK at this stage. Oh. I'm sorry, can I come back again? Yeah, so okay, in, okay. in terms of the, 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 the loss of growth, that's what we're saying, we're not saying, um, it would be a reduced growth rather than, right, over, uh, have you anticipated any immediate impact, impact in terms of, I mean, for instance, you say of uh, companies are over a uh, 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 double stocking sort of thing, so presumably over the next six months after the 29th of March, they won't be buying in th those products within, so, so there'll be a reduction, we'll see a negative um, um, uh, trading uh, deficit in the next six months. Um, so. What in terms of months and and because I probably won't make the fifteen years I'm that old. So I mean, it, what's going to impact on me in the next twelve months uh, in terms of um, uh, expansion within Greater Manchester? The the answer to that question is uh, is. It all depends on the deal that we end up doing, is the short answer to that question. Um, the, uh, the the work that the government did, as I say, the economic forecast the government have done, are the, the, the impact over the 15 years, which is why we've just effectively taken that and replied it to Greater Manchester. Um, one of our kind of uh, concerns is that absolutely companies have been uh, stocking, as it were, or, or, or double stocking, um, and that whatever therefore happens to the economy, that stock will then get used up, and that could lead to the to lo it looking as if we are having economic issues, whether or not we actually are. Um, and that obviously, you know, recession is all about confidence. Um, and therefore, if people see that actually there is lack of growth because of that using of that stock, that potentially could, could spook the horses, as it were. And, and that's one of the concerns. So we've, we've not done any, you know, this is what it looked like in six months' time, this is what it looked like a year's time, partly because economic forecasts are incredibly inaccurate, and partly because um, actually we, we don't know what that will look like, because it will all depend on the nature of the, the deal that is ultimately done but, but it is normal business contingency planning um mark next and then uh, kate thanks yeah um, i know it's been said before many times but the only certainty of the situation is that there is no certainty at the moment it, it, it seems to me i just wanted to pick up on the point about companies relocating because it is very important um a very important issue but i think arguably the bigger issue is not so much companies relocating uh, to, the, to, to the EU member states, um, but actually curtailing investment here. I mean, the, the most recent example, of course, is Nissan up in the northeast. But if I take where they're not pulling out yet, anyway, uh, but they've clearly said that the level of investment is going to be changed quite significantly. Uh, in my particular patch, I have three European multinationals. We have Man Diesel, uh, Tallis, who make the French underwater sonars uh, that are actually on our nuclear submarines um, and BASF, their UK headquarters, is in Chile. Now, I don't think any of those three, as far as I know, touch wood, 
are in the process of considering pulling out of the UK altogether. But if you were on the main board of any of those companies, sat in Paris or Berlin or wherever else, and you've got a plant in Portugal, a plant in Spain, a plant in France and a plant in Germany, why would you opt to put the investment into the one that's not a member of the club in the UK? So I think the bigger danger is not necessarily companies pulling out, but the European multinationals that we have got based here deciding they'll keep what they've got, but plans for future expansion and future investment have certainly now, in my view, got a massive question mark against them. I, I'm interested, Simon, as a view about the comparative danger companies pulling out and companies staying, but just not investing in the same way. Yeah. I mean, what, what, what we are absolutely seeing is companies' investment decisions being either taking far longer to make that investment decision or those investment decisions being um, put on hold effectively uh, until the situation is, is clearer. Um, you, know, you, you asked the question about, you know, why would you invest in the UK rather than a European plan? It, it really depends on your motives for um, that investment. Um, it, you know, are you trying to serve the UK market? Are you trying to serve the European market? You know, so, so why, why is your plant in the UK? Um, you know, is it about skills? Is it about cost, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and there was a kind of actually quite an interesting article on, on uh, Radio 4 last night about the, the motivation of car manufacturers to invest in the UK or, or, or not. Um, but so I think the, the so broadly, very simply, and in, in, in a short answer is, I think you're absolutely right. We are going to, you know, that, that future investment is, is, is absolutely a crucial issue. Um, and as I say, we're already seeing investment decisions taking longer to land or not being made at all until we are a lot clearer on, the, on our future trading relationship. Kate. Thank you. Um, yeah, I read recently about the worries in schools around providing uh, school meals and their preparedness for um, Brexit. And I wondered how realistic you thought that threat was and if the schools are doing anything to prepare. Um, I'll have to check up on that, actually. That's a very, very good question. I mean, the, 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 the issues of uh, food, fuel and... Um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, f food, energy, and, and fuel are being looked at as a, a national level about how do you ensure the continued supply of all three of those. Um, uh, I don't know whether or not there is any specific action that our schools are taking. I I will check and come back to you on that. Fair that, and I say you know, the, I think it's important we do that actually, but, but, but clearly be even more airing of the corporate um, of the school system. Sure. So if we can now move onwards then, and are there any declarations of interest? Well, thank you. Can we, can we look at the minutes of the previous meeting held on the 11th of January? Any, any comments? Or can we approve them? Right, we're going to approve those. Um, the next thing is the work programme. So, so we've just uh, shifted things around slightly in terms of the uh, work programme, particularly for uh, March and April. Um, we obviously want to have a kind of major discussion on the local industrial strategy next time round, although obviously want to update you on where that's got to uh, based on the combined authority paper that came out yesterday at today's meeting, and I'll talk to you about that later. Um, the cultural strategy and the uh, women, women's uh, employability and equality issues will come next time round, and con confirmation that Andy Burnham will come into the March meeting as well. Um, and therefore, on that basis, we've slipped the business and science, which are just kind of regular updates, uh, slipped those into the April uh, meeting so that we've got enough time for uh, the local industrial strategy and cultural strategy and Andy next time round, and then business and science and the GMS update in, in the April meeting. Just to add to that, that um, clearly members wanted to have some another uh, report from the airport, possibly a visit to the airport. That that has been explored and that's been agreed in principle, hasn't it? But we're just going to get the actual dates for it. But realistically, it'll be in the, in the next municipal year now. Are we happy with the um, work plan? Thank you. So we're now on to um, item number seven. The uh, Great Manchester Draft Employment Charter. 
thank you, Chair. I'm going to run through an introduction to this paper, and then I will let John take us through the detail um, from the Combined Authority. So the Greater Manchester Strategy Implementation Plan uh, contained included the development of a good employment charter, which is aligned to the two priorities to develop good jobs with opportunities for people to progress and develop, and for a thriving and productive economy in all parts of Greater Manchester. Uh, in order to get to this stage, a consultation had been launched in March 2018, um, and input from private, public sector employers, trade unions, districts, and other individuals and organisations was sought. Um, as part of the consultation launch, we set out how better engagement, uh, better employee engagement can lead to increased productivity and better services, and we asked for the views of these organisations and individuals on what should go in. Uh, the responses received came from the, the range of organisations that I've set out and from employees across all sectors uh, represented in Greater Manchester, and a proposition was developed based on these responses on how the Charter should work. We then subsequently launched a second consultation in October 2018 on the proposition that had been developed. In responses to this, we used to develop the model that is set out in this paper and decide the next steps around implementation. And uh, John is going to take us through the detail of the model that's proposed and the implementation plan. Thank you. Thank you. And <clears throat> just to add my thanks as well to the, uh, the task and finish group of this uh, committee looking at inclusive growth who helped with the um, uh, over last summer, particularly with the draft of the, the second consultation and the proposition that, um, that was published uh, back in October and November. So... Um, Can we just jump in there in case we give a verbal update on, on the work they're doing at, at, at the end of the session? Oh, yeah. great. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so, yes, so we've had the, um, the, the second... Uh, consultation which Councillor Fielding mentioned uh, finished in November um, and there was on the back of that strong support for the proposition that had been put forward and for the principle of having a, a charter it, itself and the um, and therefore of the last uh, month or so since the end since we've been going through those consultation responses we've been refining uh, how the charter might work and the paper before you today sets that out and in uh, just briefly to run through that it's, it's now a, a journey for employers. It's about supporting employers to higher employment standards and the sort of the productivity and service benefits which come th through that and, and therefore having a number of tiers. So a supporters network, membership, advocates who would make the case for the, um, uh, for the charter. Uh, secondly, bringing in the support that's already available to employers around the city region to help them do that. Some of it provided by the growth company, but others, the Chamber of Commerce, other um, private organisations, investors in people, similar programmes. Because, and the reason for that is one of the, the, the strong responses we got back through the consultation was that there's a lot of uh, support that's already out there and what would be useful for this process to do was brigade that together so that employers could more easily access the sort of support that they needed. Um, linked to that as well, uh, the proposal is to use existing accreditations for measuring these things. Again, one of the, the strong con responses we got back throughout the consultation process was there are already accreditations and processes out there doing this. Don't duplicate it. Don't invent new bu bureaucracy that's not necessary, particularly because this will always be a voluntary process, and therefore, if it, if it puts off employers, if there are barriers to employers, it just won't work. So what we're looking at is using those ac existing accreditations which are already there to measure that high performance, and the, the Greater Manchester Charter in that way becomes a framework which fits them all together. Uh, and also linked to that, the tying in with the charters and support that already exists in the districts. Now, so, some of those were um, discussed in detail in the, the first consultation which went out last March. But what we're looking at is, is using the, uh, the, the Greater Manchester Charter as a way of partly of signposting that support that's already available in many districts to employers, but also where there are already charter mechanisms in place which are, are consistent with this, basically having reciprocal, reciprocal arrangements. So if you're a member, member of one, you're <coughs> automatically a member of the other and vice versa to, again, avoid the duplication. Uh, the membership uh, aspect uh, of this, the, we've identified, as the paper said, some key employment characteristics or characteristics of, of, of good employment. Um, there was some discussion through, is one of the items in the second consultation actually came up in the, the, the task and finish group discussions last September about sort of whether, whether an employer should have to meet all of those characteristics or a proportion of them to get, to get membership. 
uh, there were a variety of views in response to that in the consultation, but the proposal here is that in order to sort of set the standard high to basically say that uh, to, be, to, to get membership of the, the charter, uh, an employer would have to show good practice across all those areas, but at the same time, by having this supporters network attached to it, it offers a way into the process and a stepping stone for, for employers who aren't there yet but do want to, in, uh, want to engage. Um, just a, around the, the incentives was an, uh, to sign up to the Charter is another issue that's come up regularly through, the, um, through it, it, its development. Uh, we're proposing a link to procurement through the, um, uh, through the, uh, the social value framework which already exists in all the districts, so tapping into what's already there. Uh, um, and also looking at um, how this can be linked into the investment funds which the combined authority uh, already runs and has uh, control over to encourage it. But most, most of all, what, we'd, what we're keen to do is encourage employers to, to sign up by showing the benefits of doing so, that this is, this is something which can support businesses to become more productive, can provide better, ensure that better services are provided by public sector and voluntary and community sector employers. And that's, I think, where the, the advocates part of this is so important because, again, a strong message that's come back through is, is we can make the case to employers, but what is most powerful is employers already doing this, going to other employers and, and sharing good practice and, and showing how they can do that. So, uh, so there was a lot of support for that through the, the, the final session of consultation. Um, in terms of where we are now, we're now, um, if, the, if this model is, is approved, then we're into discussions with the growth company about uh, implementation, the resources around it, working out the details of how these things are measured, and also just finally, but in some ways most importantly, how we develop the campaign that goes around this, how, how we can make, I mean, raise its profile to encourage um, employers to sign up, but also for the, the, the reasons I just mentioned, being able to show why this is a good thing for employers to do, get that message out and get employers talking to each other about it. That compa campaign becomes, I think, almost as important as the design of the sort of the charter process itself. So that's, uh, that's where we've reached at the moment. Questions? Mark? Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I think, I think uh, as a committee, we're, we're all very supportive of this when it was first discussed. Um, whenever it was a year ago here, yeah. um, feels like now. And um, I think uh, it, it's a very good scheme. There's now a bit of flesh on the bone, so we can see the d general direction it's going. I agree with the point that was made about peer group pressure as the best way of getting uh, companies involved in it. But right from the start, when we had our initial discussion, we uh, a number of companies were named. Um, as not being exemplars of best practice. Um, and I'm wondering, I read the section on incentives, the short section on incentives. Uh, incentives to join the Charter will include the celebration of good practice. I can't imagine a company, let's say, just choosing a name at random like Amazon, being particularly bothered about being, I hope I'm wrong, but you know, being particularly bothered about invited being invited to a celebration of good practice. That's not necessarily been the way they've shaped in other parts of the world where they've operated. So my question is, what are we going to do about those who are impervious to peer group pressure and those who are reluctant for whatever reason or motivation, but reluctant to join this? Because if all this becomes is a system where those who are already doing the right thing get together and feel very good about themselves, there will be no point at all. And that is, frankly, what happens at a lot of these sort of celebratory uh, events. So the question is, what are we going to do? You might, in other circumstances, refer to them as the hard-to-reach groups, but what are we going to do about those? Because I think that's what a number of members of the committee had in mind when we first talked about this initiative and gave our back into it being set up. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, and um, uh, yeah, I mean that's a, a point which has been been raised with us by yourselves, but right through the process and a, a very fair challenge. I mean, it, it's, I think it's worth saying to start with, we're partly working with what we've got. Some of, some of those issues that you describe are around the sort of the tax and regulatory issues in the labour market, and those powers aren't devolved at the moment. 
maybe we'll at, at some point have have um, more we can do on that. But but we're working within the space we've got, and I think and therefore the fact that this has to be voluntary means that to an extent there's only so far we can go. Because in the end, if employers don't engage and sign up, we don't have uh, many tools to uh, uh, to to challenge that. That said, I think some of the, the incentives we've talked about, some of them are harder edged, if you like, than others. So there is, there is the celebratory aspect, there is the sharing of good practice, the case studies to make the case to uh, encourage em employers to, um, to raise standards, um, but particularly the procurement aspect and the investment fund aspect are um, perhaps harder edged in uh, incentives, if you like, because then there will be a very, a, a, solid incentive for firms that are engaging in procurement or looking for investment to engage with the charter. That said, I, I, I accept the limitations. There are just by nature of the powers we've got, there are some employers we just won't be able to reach through this process. Kate, did you have your hand over that or do, you, or do you want to bring in your, your, um, your study group at this point in time? Or Yeah, okay. Right. Ray. Thank you, Chair. Uh, forgive me for this question, if you don't mind, but I've read the charter, and it just seems to me it's another icon, something you can put on your, on your paper, which you can send out to other companies, which is very nice, like investors in people and what have you. But those investors in people plaques soon start to degrade away and they fade away. How will this be used to overcome the skills shortages and get the actual apprentices back into college and universities? And that's something we've been very conscious of going through this process and, and didn't, didn't want to, yes, just add to the next set of badges that go on letterheads, but everyone's forgotten in two or three years' time. And I think, I think that it's because of the feedback around that and, and, and the, I mean, both from the sort of employers and employees engaged in this process that we've, we've come quite a long way in the 12 months since the first consultation. Because I, I think originally the proposition was closer to what you've just described in terms of you know, here's a list of good characteristics and if you you know you hit four of six you don't get it and five of six you do and then you get a badge sort of thing and I, but i think because of the limitations of that you've just described is why we've now reached something which is we, in some ways a charter isn't a very good term for it what it's actually is more of a mechanism of support for employers so hence hence providing the incentives to move up through the tiers to best practice but also wrapping the support around that so that if an employer is you know, looking to raise pay to pay, pay the living wage, there's the Living Wage Foundation who can do it. Or if they're looking to um, improve flexible working, this is, these are the groups in Greater Manchester who can help you find that, that, uh, that, um, uh, the, the, the best way to deliver that. So it's, it, it, in that way, we're very much are aiming to have something that's embedded in the, the sort of the business and employer support architecture and offering Greater Manchester rather and not fall into the trap you just described of here's another badge which everyone's forgotten in four years quite what it was for in the first place. Any more questions? Jude and then um, Yvonne after that. Uh, having just come from the independent prosperity view, and I don't want to preempt what you're going to say later, I think the strong message that I heard, I heard there was the importance of health and well-being. And I wonder if you think there are any implications for the Charter in its current form in terms of that strong message that we heard this, this afternoon. Uh, yes, I, th I, think, I think there are. I mean, bo both specifically in the sort of the characteristics of good employment which have been developed to this, which includes a healthy uh, and productive workplace but it's also it, it's been interesting over the last two or three months how much the charter has started to link up more and more to the local industrial strategy process because in one way you can look at this as being about raising employment standards but you come at it from another angle and it's actually in the, in the words of the prosperity uh, commission we're publishing today it's about are employers using their human capital to best effect to raise productivity so it and that's 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 part of the case I hope we'll be able to make to employers that this is this is not an additional burden. This is actually how you become more successful. And I think the fact that we've had today you know, leading, leading economists, worldwide economists, let alone in this country, saying actually that is the way that you deliver more productive and higher quality firms, this is not a trade-off, will hopefully be quite powerful then for building the case around the Charter. Yvonne. Thank you, Chair. Um, mine is from a different angle, really. I'm, I've 
been, it, I thought this was such a good idea, I went on the, the, the working group early on. And I look around here at this room now, and I think there's only three of us left uh, that were actually here when we discussed it initially. And, and I've looked back through my notes, and I think the first time I've got notes about it and things like that was, was June 2017. Now, we're, we're looking to launch this at the end of this year, is it December, it says in the thing? It seems to me an inordinate length of time to have got to this point. And I, and I realise it's not the only thing on your table, John, that you have to deal with. I, and, and you and Nick are lovely, but I do really think that we really ought to have been further along with this, because actually Jude's point is good, because things have moved on. You know, things that, you know, there's other issues and so on, we should be doing it. And we, are no, we don't seem to be any further along the line than we were. I know we have to do consultation, but it does seem to have taken an inordinate amount of time to do the consultation that, that, that you've done. And, uh, and, and I just think it becomes sort of less relevant, really, as we're going along. So I was just saying, and I said, I said before the last time we met, can we please get a wriggle on with this? Because I think it's really important and it's something that we should be proud of and something that we should be trumpeting and doing something about. Uh, but as I say, otherwise, none of us would be here to see the blooming thing launch because we'll all be, you know, perhaps, you know, who knows what's going to happen in May, you know. So I, I, I really would like to see it perhaps brought forward a bit further and let's do something at least this summer to uh, even if it's only a, you know something that we launch it in a better time of year really but but something that we we could had something that we can actually use and promote Thank you. I take that as a compliment, or at least some of it. Uh, the um, uh, yeah, I, th I think the um, I think one of the things, given the criticism at the start of this was we were rushing into to it too fast. I take some some reassurance from what you've just said. But the the thing we certainly I've learned going through this process is that co-design, i.e., working with employers, employees, trade unions, the business groups, the Chamber of Commerce, the, uh, the local NHS, the campaign groups, the universities, there's not really a shortcut. I mean, to be, we could have come to you 12 months ago, probably with an employment charter proposition. I think there would have been two problems with it. One, it wouldn't have been as good as this, because the advantage of going out, getting views, having conversations, consulting, initially on to get people's ideas and then on the proposition was that I think it's a better proposition, partly for the, the reasons we've just discussed of m moving away from being more of a tick box exercise to something that's more fundamental around employment and productivity. But I think the, th the second important reason is that um, it's, it's been crucial to carrying those organisations with us through the process because, in the, because of this, the voluntary point, if, if the employers and employ, employer groups don't sign up to this and don't want to engage, it's not going to work. And therefore, having them deeply involved all the way along helps, and that, take, that does take time. Um, and I think the, it's interesting, the Liverpool City Region have published their consultation um, uh, last, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it looks very similar to ours. In fact, to the point where it discusses what's happening in Salford and Oldham, which was a uh, interesting choice of copy and paste. But they, I think what I think what they'll they'll find is that there's no there's no um, sh there's no shortcut to this unless you engage and carry all the the relevant parties with you. Then it's it's not going to work. And just on on the um, on the just to be clear on the future timescale, I think in terms of announcement of what this thing will do, I think we're. You know, if this is approved, then we're about there in terms of what we're going to do. But as I said, the, the points that have come through the consultation about the need to build a campaign around this, the need to get the detail right in terms of what, what, what does excellent recruitment look like, uh, the need to pilot this. Is good. So, so we are, I think we're about there on the proposition. What the next stage and what's going to take a few more months is rolling that out and developing it. Can I ask, please, what initiatives are being taken properly to involve small businesses? So we, we've worked firstly through the uh, business groups that are already, uh, that the, 
that work with small businesses. So the Federation of Small Businesses have been closely involved in the design process, uh, along with the CBI, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, and other employer groups. And then also we've tried to push it out as far as we can during the consultation to reach uh, as many as possible. But it's, and, and I think one, one result of that is in terms of the comments that came back into the uh, the, uh, the second consultation, there were a lot of concerns about how does this play out for a small employer. For example, how do you show progression opportunities if you've only got one employee? And so I think s some of what we do next in terms of the implementation is about working out, uh, if, there's, if there's general agreement, this is what good employment looks like, it still plays out in different circumstances, different size of employers and different sectors. So that's some of that detail we've now got to get Right, and we'll take a, a little bit of time without stretching the patience of, uh, of others. Can, can I just come in on that point? Because I mean, that, that's my concern, is the effect on small businesses. Because, I mean, my background was KPMG. We were investing in people. You know, when we first put it in place, I just with what Ray said, it was actually first rate in fact. We learned a lot from that process. Although eventually, regrettably, some things do become a bit of a, a follow-up tick box exercise. And that's the other concern, that, that, that it is becomes a tick box exercise. So, so the principles are happy with, but, it, but it's how it pans out in reality. And, and it's, you have got differences between large organisations with opportunities, particularly for career development and everything else, compared to small businesses. And what is the cost of all this, you know, in terms of the, the, the monitoring you know, by the growth hub? And you know, will a levy be charged on, on businesses to actually fund this? So if that's the case, then for small businesses, that could be a, a disproportionate cost compared to the benefit they're getting. For a large organisation, there should be no problem at all. So my, my issue with this is the devil in the detail, which I think you, you actually talk about in the, in, in the actual next steps of the implementation. And I'd like to understand a bit, bit more about what the, the, the implications are for you know, particularly small businesses. Because they say conceptually, it's got to be the right thing. So um, I mean, that, that, that's a lot of observation rather than a, than, than a, a question. But I still would, would you know, welcome your thoughts on that. The, the point about charging actually came up in the, the first consultation. And there was a very, in terms of responses to that, there was a very strong feedback that if we introduce some sort of charging around this, then that would act as a barrier, particularly for small employers, and that therefore and say, given this, the whole the process is voluntary, and we need to get take up if it's going to work. That that was not something we we should do. Part of the thinking as well of using existing accreditations in terms of measurement was that that you sort of avoid um, some of that duplication. That said, and a, a, a point that has came back to the second consultation was, if you just use those accreditations, then the you're effectively saying to an employer, you have to sign up to all these things, and often these things cost money. So, you, so, so that also leaving open the opportunity for employers to say, I haven't got an accreditation in this area, but look at the great things I'm doing around flexible working or recruitment and so forth. And that, and the devil is definitely in that detail because how do you how would you make those judgments consistently? How do you ensure that the that monitoring it? Th there was there was a lot of feedback in the consultation about how self assessment should be done, which I think will be helpful. But there is, and I think that's why we're going to be into piloting this rather than trying, we, we, you can set up the supporters network quite quickly and get people engaged, but in terms of the actual membership, it, a lot of, it, I think we're going to need to pilot it because I suspect if we tried to straight away get that right with a lot of, a large number of employees, we'd find that something for, that worked for KPMG didn't work out for a small employer in social care and therefore there's going to be a lot of balance here. Yeah, that's right. why I took away from that, the, the fact yep. that you want to pilot these things. I think that must be the way forward. And, and was I, I got sympathy with Yvonne in terms of it's, it's taking a long time. I think better to get it right, you know, through pilots rather than, rather than alienating the individual. I mean, this is a small example I, I picked up here. On your key characteristics, um, and it's, you know, the key would be it's secure work or flexible work. Now, arguably, those two are diametrically opposed. I mean, I think I know what you're talking about. But, but there's little nuances, perhaps, within, within some of the, these, you know, uh, if you like, uh, objectives, again, that would need to be, be fleshed out. And you do that through a policy. So, um, um, any more questions?
But we, we pause that then for, for um, Kate to give an update on her um, uh, task and study group, isn't it? Thank you, Chair. Um, I know you asked for a brief update, but you didn't specify where is it public interpretation of brief or a politician's interpretation of brief. Um, but having attended six or seven meetings, I felt we ought to justify uh, to a certain extent the amount of work we've done because we have you know, put a lot into the consultation and, and hopefully you found that useful. So um, you, we recognise some of the, those broader aspirations as well uh, that you're trying to achieve, such as uh, promoting local labour and the importance of that being um, part of the inclusive economy and the growth economy, that kind of thing is very important, um, creating thriving communities. Better working practices, we noted that the um, TUC and the unions were involved in that consultation, which we thought was very important. The social value that you've talked about, again, um, very important contribution to, to social value if this whole employer's charter is successful. And we recognise the important work. Uh, we, sorry, we met with Peter Schofield, of course, who's done all the work on social value. So I just wanted to note my thanks to him in sort of reinforcing and underpinning that social value contribution. Um, Again, the, uh, a lot of what people have asked questions on, we brought up through that um, task and finish consultation process, such as the um, importance of education and training for opportunities for pro progression and development. Um, one of the things that's not been brought up here, which we talked about quite a lot, was equality and diversity and how, how that really has to be very fundamental within there. If it's not addressing the issues of equality and diversity, we did feel that it wasn't really fulfilling the, the, its potential function. Um, we also recognise as well that if it's successful, it's potentially a cost saving to the public service as well, because it should reduce um, demands <coughs> on other, other areas of public service. Um, we noted as well the rise in insecure work that is growing locally and nationally. And we really felt that if the um, Employ employment charter, if it's to um, be fully owned by the people of Grand Greater Manchester, it really has to demonstrate that it's doing something about the levels of insecure work. We also noticed that the, um, in the within the first consultation, there was quite a low number, well, like just over a quarter of the people who responded were um, from the private sector. So we still do have concerns around, you know, the possible lack of buying from the the private sector, you know, public sector already a lot of the what is required of the employment charter, the public sector is doing a lot of that. The voluntary sector, perhaps not so much, but still there. We, we really need to ensure we've got that buying from the private sector. Um, and also, I noticed Councillor Hunter talked about some of those harder to reach businesses. Again, it's something that we, we um, address through the task and finish. And um, one of the things that came up was, you know, what, whether these, whether, whether it should be uh, an obligation perhaps to some of those higher tiers, whether they should have some union rec trade union recognition. And I know, understand you explained some of the challenges <coughs> around that, but I still feel it's something that we should perhaps air in a wider forum to, to look at that more closely. Um, I don't understand why a big company would not want to have trade union recognition, but want to be part of the employment charter. So there may be a place there for, for trade unions within there. We thought the tiered structure was very good. Um, um, that opportunity for lots of different um, sizes and different types of organisations to be involved. As regards uh, monitoring and recording for the accreditation, um, sorry, just bear with me. We were just concerned that you, the Living Wage Foundation is brought up regularly, but if we are, if if it's going to be demonstrated there, uh, each employ, employer's commitment to uh, the employment charter or fulfilling different aspects. Best aspects of the employment charter, what are all these different things that they're going to, those boxes that they're going to tick? We know we've got the employment charter, uh, the Living Wage Foundation, what about all the others? Can we just ensure that all of those aspects for the employment charter are covered? Um, 
I'm just trying to skip past people, bits where I've written about that people have already asked questions about, so if you just bear with me. Um, yeah, I'll just talk a little about governance and oversight because it's something, again, so, that was brought up quite often. Um, uh, the body that, uh, the, I understand that the body that oversees this is going to be the growth company and it's going to host this charter accreditation. Um, but we want, to be, uh, we want to be sure that that is going to have some representation from either uh, this body that uh, ensures that all of those different parts, those different standards are being achieved. Um, and again, I just raise the issue of equality and diversity because it's so important to us. You know, I don't know whether the growth company would think that was as important as we do. So that's why it's so important that other bodies that represent workers or represent um, people in our communities are represented within that governance and monitoring structure. Um, and just a quick note on resourcing as well. I think we're at a stage now where I think we need some... Uh, more detail on how this is all going to be resourced, how it's going to be funded. I think we're ready for, you know, the next stage, certainly for our task and finish, would want to look at that more closely. Just finally, I would echo the, the what others have said around timing. I, I was originally, we were originally told that the launch would be December, January 2019. So it looks like we're going to be well past that. Um, I won't say any more on that because I think enough has been said. I would just finish by thanking yourself for all the time that you've spent explaining the work of your uh, team. And also, if you wouldn't mind, the passing on our thanks as well to Susan Ford, who did so much work to, to drive this and advise and encourage us. Thank you. Thank you for that very interesting and comprehensive update. So, um, do you want to add to that? Come back on a, a couple of points there. The, um, the the point about equality and diversity actually raised by yourselves, and actually quite uh, quite a few responses to the second consultation uh, as well. And so the um, uh, we had some the, some respondents had said, oh well, shouldn't there be another employment characteristic on the, sort of the as well as the ones that are around there around um, equality and diversity? Which I think the general view was that's that wasn't the right route to go down because actually those characteristics are there should be driving towards equality and diversity in terms of recruitment practice, in terms of what happens in the workplace, in terms of uh, flexible working and so forth. So, um, but it was it was definitely right that we'd lost some of that in the co by, by focusing so much on the mechanism, we'd lost some view of what the aim, what the end of this was that we're trying to deliver. So we will definitely bring that back in um, at the next stage. The um, on the, the governance, uh, the growth company and governance uh, and oversight. So yet the, the growth company now helping us with work through some of the detail and the thinking is this will be hosted with the growth company. But in terms of over, the oversight and steering of it, what our, our hope is is that the groups who've, who've helped us develop this charter, so uh, the, the employer groups, the business groups, uh, the trade unions and so forth, will effectively carry on owning this. So the oversight and steering of it will be done by a panel representing those groups, uh, and, and that the 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 it will be a, there'll be a freestanding unit which is um, delivering it. And I think that's important, partly to continue this sense of buy-in and engagement with it, but also that the, the the charter is not going to be a static thing. It will change over time. Partly as our understanding of what good employment is changes over time. Um, and lastly, just on the. Um, uh, the, the private sector buy-in point. I mean, it's a, it's a good challenge. I think where where I'm quite hopeful is that we've we've got buy-in from the representative bodies of the the um, uh, from the private sector. So, an enormous amount of help from the Chamber of Commerce, the Federation of Small Businesses, and others. I think what we probably haven't done yet is reached far beyond the membership of those into the rest of the private sector. And part of the challenge around the campaign, the profile launching, uh, the, the profile uh, raising the, the profile of it is going to be how we get those messages out. And partly that will hopefully happen through the procurement angles and the investment angles. But there is a there is a big uh, challenge to succeed in that. Okay, do you want to say anything back against that response? Fine. You make a very good point, actually, with regards to, I think, the, the, the steering group. I mean, you, you do need to have, have, have a board. You've got, like, the employers' uh, organisations. 
because voluntary scheme and, and what, what they think is going to happen doesn't happen in reality, then I, I think the whole thing would fall, you know, could fall apart. So I think that's important. I also think it's what you, you hit the nail on the head as well, that sometimes these bodies, particularly the CBI, which tends to represent big organisations, is not necessarily in touch with small organisations. Federation of Small Businesses is definitely in touch. And, the, and, the, and you know, they obviously represent a, a different type of organisation. But, but I think that, that's important because, the, 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 as we said before, the, the needs and, 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 and demands, if you like, of, of medium-sized and big businesses is totally different to small businesses, which is, I think that, that that's the message you probably want, the message you've got from here, is that concern. And I want to see, going forwards, when you, you start doing these pilots, have a, a report coming back here again, in terms of, of how that is panning out, in terms of the practical issues of, of, of in, ensuring that there is buy-in, and, uh, and that um, you, you've got the support of, 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 of smaller businesses. And clearly you, you'll work closely again with, with Kate and her team as well to, to actually you know, develop this. And um, it's, you know, it's, um, it, it is difficult. I mean, it is, it is a long time since, since we, it was launched. But as I say, I, I, I th I've always had the view better to get things right, something like that, which is, which is, which is groundbreaking, ra rather than you know, take the shooting, almost shooting from the hip. And if you do that, you almost undoubtedly end up with, 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 you know, with a problem. So um, I, think, I think that's the summary, I think. Does that reflect, if you like, the view of the committee? Good, OK. Thank you for the interesting presentations. Um, so next we're on to the, um, the full fibre program, and we've got Councillor Andrew Weston, who's the uh, portfolio lead. So we do welcome you to, get to this committee. It's, it's, in my judgment, as I've always said, it's important that we have the, uh, the political side of things as well. So you are very welcome here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I understand this is the second or third time that this report has come to. Um, the committee, so it's intended by way of an, in, of an update, but just by way of background for members. I know most of you will be aware that um, in March last year, Greater Manchester secured £23.8 million worth of funding to deliver um, local full fibre connectivity. This equated to 25% of the total funding that was available nationally and allows us to connect up to 1,300 sites in GM with full fibre. It also crucially is intended to act as a cat catalyst to leverage up to £250 million worth of private sector investment in full fibre, which ultimately could be worth up to £2.1 billion to the GM economy over the next 15 years. Effectively, what that work will do is to increase our full fibre connectivity from 2% to 25% over the next three years, which is critical to us realising our ambition to be a world-leading digital city. But it also um, gives us the best high-speed digital infrastructure in the UK. Um, it's worth bringing members' attention to the substantive change that's happened from um, the original proposals as um, intended when, when this was brought forward last year and when the funding was secured around the um, involvement of the CCGs. Timing and complexity issues have meant that the CCGs have now um, been able to satisfy their requirements for um, full fibre coverage elsewhere. Um, that shouldn't necessarily be regarded um, as a problem because what that enables us to do is to bring urban traffic control sites into scope um, of which there are some 700 assets across Greater Manchester, so it enables us to connect um, more than we originally thought would be the case. But just to mention briefly um, the Tameside approach to this, which is separate from the um, £21.3 million allocation that we're discussing here, because Tameside have a cooperative model and have £2.5 million worth of funding to deliver full fibre separate to this work. Um, I'll pass over to Phil to cover off the technical and perhaps the procurement aspects of this, but just before I do so, just with specific reference to the recommendations, particularly, obviously, I've covered the issue around 
the CCGs moving out of scope and that allowing us to bring um, the TFG and the urban traffic control work into scope. But it's just worth asking members as well to note the, um, the investment from the CA into um, the fire and rescue side of the work of 1.46 million of capital and 3.384 million for the urban traffic control work. And with that, I will hand over to Phil. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, uh, as you've got on the uh, in Section 3 onwards, uh, we've provided some more detail on the over-proposed procurement approach to this work. Uh, you know, uh, understandably, it's um, uh, quite complicated because we're combining different funding pools and different time, time, stream, uh, time streams. From a DCMS perspective, their $23.8 million has to be spent by March 2021. And part of this is making sure that we can <coughs> phase this accordingly and ensure we can deliver to their timetable time table as part of this. We've been looking at uh, how most effectively we, we go to market with these proposals. And the, the proposed approach is a northern contract and a southern contract uh, across GM with uh, Greater Manchester Combined Authority as acting as almost the, the accountable, well, as the accountable body, but also almost a framework provider for a single provider framework and then each LA will enter into its own contract. We have to do that, and this is the advice from our, our lawyers, because we ha you have to be able to capitalise the assets. This is capital funding. Uh, and with that combination of DCMS funding and LA funding, uh, uh, and indeed, from a CA perspective, for our own, our own elements, we need to be able to uh, have a process that, that enables that. Uh, we also, though, you know, we don't want to go into a single supply necessarily across Greater Manchester, but we want to be able to have some flexibility within that. And we didn't want to have a different lot per LA as well, which would have made things really quite complicated. So hence a northern and a southern uh, supplier uh, banding. Uh, we're looking to go out to procurement, having got, th having got through successfully uh, Gateway B of the DCMS's gateway process, which is authority to, to procure, uh, to proceed towards procurement. Uh, so we're looking to move forward on that uh, quite rapidly within March. But as part of that, we're looking for all districts to have uh, formal financial improvements from their investment side by, by the end of March. Um, so for me, um, just ch checking what other key points I need to raise. That we are, as part of this, working on a, a GM uh, prospectus, which is uh, a digital infrastructure prospectus in, in its full term which is about harmonising our way leaves of reconstitution and so on. And we already have some processes for this in Greater Manchester already through the, uh, the, the RAP scheme, which is managed by TFGM. This is in very much in response to market feedback as well that says, you know, when they reach the end of um, uh, a road that spans, say, Stockport and Thameside, they get differences in way leaves and, and, and reconstitution and various other things, and actually that means that the dig stops at this point and then there's a break and then they so we're trying to incentivize easier investment by um, the telcos uh, obviously to reuse existing assets but as part of this make it more cost effective so that they invest more heavily in greater manchester we have feedback which says you know in parts of the country um, it is three times as expensive as in other parts of the country uh, in specific boroughs to to put in digital infrastructure to put in fiber and, and, the, and the suppliers are saying we're just not going to go to the most expensive areas at the moment because there's so much to market. So we want to incentivise that across Greater Manchester, very much as Councillor Ruston's saying, in terms of that, that wider aspiration. But at the same time, try and minimise disruption, which is, which is key uh, within this. And the role and the links across to the new st um, strategic infrastructure board that's been created very much help in this context as well because I think we hopefully all agree that good connectivity ought to be like water, should be like gas, electricity, and so on. It's becoming a prerequisite uh, for so many things that we want to do across the city region. And, and, and this um, uh, as a, as will really stimulate what we have in terms of the connectivity and the basis for so many other things. Thank you. Questions? Kate. Thank you. Um, is that on? Yes. Um, you mentioned um, 1.2 about um, going from 2% coverage to 25% coverage. That would suggest that there may be priorities about where uh, that coverage is being placed. I wondered if you'd just say something about ha how those priority decisions are being made about where, they're, where the fibre is going, please. No, it's a, it's a very good question. Thank you, Councillor. Um, 
we worked with each individual borough to say which, which public sector sites would you like connected. So this has to be to avoid state aid or challenges. We have to be connecting public sector assets. That's absolutely what this is about. Uh, and we worked with each individual borough uh, and with TFGM in terms of the, the, the traffic assets to, to look at the specific sites of which sites needed to be connected within each locality to make sure that uh, uh, it was both, well, I, I've, that it was working to the, the needs of the borough in that, in that context, if that is, is fair to say. I think what we're also, we'll also be very clear about is from the DCMS funding, making sure it's equitably distributed across the whole of Greater Manchester, which is actually very much in line with findings from the Prosperity Review, uh, because there's huge discrepancies. So in Bury, actually, five to the premises is about 0.1% at the moment. It's incredibly low. Whereas other parts of the city region, particularly the regional centre, uh, in some areas, it's, quite, it's about 7%. Uh, so it, it is very variable. We also have those situations where um, I mean, there, are, there are assets already in the ground, undoubtedly across Greater Manchester, belonging to various different companies. They, they guard that information quite carefully because there's, there, there is a, almost a race on to, to, to build uh, digital infrastructure. And no one wants to overbuild anyone else. So we're working within that broader context as well. You probably will have seen recent announcements by quite a lot of the the telcos in the last six months because this area is really hopping, hop, hotting up and particularly with 5G coming downstream because you have to have a fibre network to build 5G on. You, you, it needs the fibre backhaul. Copper's not good enough for the connectivity requirements. So it's becoming quite a complicated space. And that's one of the reasons, for example, in Manchester, they haven't gone for the anchor tenancy approach because there's quite a lot of fibre already in Manchester and, they, and there's a risk of overbuilding ex existing fibre which government would, would struggle to support. Barry. Oh, Chair. <laughs> We're just looking at me now very, very worriedly. Uh, could I just go back to 1.1 and ask, just to clarify my own mind, the 1,300 public sector sites are presumably in places like schools and so on, and the fibre is going out to that. Now, are we talk, when you mentioned about the um, private sector investment, 250 million, does that mean you're going to hope that the private sector will take the fibre from these public sector sites into local businesses and homes? We have to be quite careful from a state aid perspective to be not funding uh, uh, companies to, to, to build out to yeah. specific homes uh, or premises for that basis. So hence our focus has to be connecting public sector assets yeah. through this process. Um, I think it would be fair to say that uh, those organisations who are looking to invest in these capabilities, they might be taking a broader view about what else could be achieved across across Greater Manchester. I think one of the other things to say, though, is whilst there's, you know, we've listed 1,300 sites, those are our minimum sites, and, we, and through the procurement process, we're hoping to incentivise, or we are taking evidence from other parts of the country where we've seen uh, up to a third additional sites being connected on top of that. So we have our must-haves, our should-haves, our would-like-to-haves, and so on, and they include quite a additional range of other sites. So those are the core, this is the minimum almost that we're planning to get, and we think we, we will exceed that. Can I just, sorry, just, I know this is just the second part of it. You mentioned existing assets. Uh, about 10 years ago, I think it was Nanex installed in Councillor Weston's ward, actually, quite an extensive network, which caused chaos when they did it. But it just seems to have lied, lied dormant, all that network. Do it, well, have we, we've Presumably, we've got records of all these things that were installed over the last six or seven years. Uh, I mean, it won't be nine next now. Somebody else will have taken it over. But it was a massive investment, but hardly, hardly used. It was perhaps a bit before its time in the sense that people you know, didn't expect high-speed broadband and so on like they do nowadays. But it's just a question, really. Do, do we actually know about all these assets that have been uh, laid in the ground in the past? Uh, there, there are a number of assets. And, and, and I don't know if, like me, you, as you walk down the street, you look at the little name badges on the covers. Um, and there are quite a few 9X ones around still. Uh, I can't remember if 9X ended up as part of Gamma or went up into Virgin's network. I, I forget. But um, there, are, there are a significant number of assets already. And that will... Uh, you know, uh, we anticipate that those assets will be brought more into play by the companies bidding to supply these contracts. Now, if it is cheaper for them to leverage existing assets, we will be expecting them to be connecting more sites. Jude. 
Uh, forgive me if I've missed this in the report, but um, I'm aware that the uh, GMP are really keen to Im improve their digital offer, and I don't see mention of them. Are they within scope of this or not? They're not in specifically in the scope of this because every single one of their sites has fibre connected connectivity already. Um, so they have said, well, actually, and, and also the term of their arrangements meant that actually they didn't really have the opportunity to, to move off that contract in, in the timing of this piece of work. What we're seeing in it, and as Councillor Weston has said, though, that the, the Virgin offer for the CCG network was undoubtedly as strong as it was because this work helped drive that process, and they were very keen to keep that business. Uh, now, I think it's very positive that they're going to be building out to 485 GP practices all over the Greater Manchester region uh, as part of that, which will be putting in additional fibre. So if you look at that work, this work collectively, and then uh, other investment sites through GMP, then we, we hopefully get to a, a very positive position. Any more questions? A couple of uh, detailed questions, actually. Um, the first one, it's in 3.7, it says all districts will need to have formal financial approvals for their investment before the end of March 2019. So, first of all, are you on target for that? I know, I think there was some concern expressed quite some time ago as whether or not all council will be able to sign up by then. And then allied to that, in 5.2, it says the cost of fibre rollout can be significantly reduced if GMLAs adopt common processing criteria to utilities infrastructure delivery. This can be achieved by the wireless adoption of a greater management prospectus, and TFGM is working with local authorities to ensure that this will be in place in July 2019. So what risk is there that, having signed off the financial case, that when you get this prospectus out in three months later, four months later, there's, there is, if you like, a difference of view there, which could obviously impinge on what is happening? The, there, um, so let me answer each of those in turn. So my, my, the feedback I have from the team working on this is that we are on, on track for that March 2019 uh, sign-off um, by each of the districts. Uh, so that's, that's, as, that's, what, that's what I'm being told. Uh, and, I, I, and, and there has been a huge amount of work with each of the districts, individual meetings, at length, um, with a variety of colleagues in each each borough, which has uh, which has been incredibly productive actually through the, through this process, and, and certainly my thanks go to everyone who's been heavily involved in that. From a prospectus, um, uh, the perspective perspective of the prospectus. That's sorry, that doesn't help. Um, uh, we we have this overlapping time time window. Absolutely, we've drafted a prospectus as things stand. We're working with colleagues through that. We're leveraging processes like the GM wraps uh, and so on to be able to minimise the risk around some of that. What we want to be able to say is, when we go out to tender, um, respond on the basis that these, these things have been resolved and we are working to resolve a number of those. Uh, we are um, not going to be uh, so specific in that that it precludes, the, that it holds up the tender process, but it enables us to progress that work so that we can hit the July deadline. I understand, but, but in, inevitably, because you, you, they're not contemporaneous, then there is a risk, it may be a small risk, that, that the actual funding that's been approved can't actually deliver what becomes the, the final output when that document or prospectus is completed in, in July 2019. Uh, the, the, we're very aware of that and I'm actively managing that risk and it's, uh, yeah, I, I agree. There is, a, there is something that absolutely needs mitigating there and we are looking at that very carefully because we absolutely need to make sure that what we commit to when we go out with this procurement process is, is, is deliverable. Um, our expectations is that we will have an agreement to a minimum prospectus, as it were, by the time we go out to tender. And that risk, albeit I think what you're saying probably a small risk, has been conveyed to all ten authorities they are aware of all this, this yes. if you like, yes. uh, non-contemporaneously. Non Absolutely. We, we, have, we have a, thank you, Chair, we have a, um, uh, a number of groups that are meeting around this to, and meet regularly, uh, as well as a full fibre, full fibre programme board, which uh, uh, Tony Oakman, the Chief Executive um, uh, of Bolton, chairs. The last point, which is 3.9, in this contract overview rule, Transfer for Greater Manchester will be working closely with local authorities to ensure issues that the potential lead to cost overruns are identified early and adjustments made to the overall program. 
that's fine. But if there were to be cost overruns, and let's say, uh, I won't choose my own um, uh, authority, let's say old, but the additional cost from that, how will that be borne? Will that be borne by just by Oldham, or is it joint and several reliable across the whole of the town authorities? Uh, our proposed way of working on this is that, um, and it depends whose responsibility it is for the cost overrun, uh, okay. which, which is the challenge. So we, we want to be managing the supplier collectively, and we're proposing this interoperability agreement to, to, to enable us to collectively manage suppliers in a holistic way uh, around this. Um, we want to minimise the, the and, part, and the prospectus plays into this the scenarios where the responsibility lands on our on our shoulders. And at the same, t by the same token, we want to be putting in place through the contract procedures very clear um, incentives to hit key milestones uh, and penalties for not hitting key milestones around this uh, with suppliers because. Uh, we are on a tight time frame for this, and, and the work needs to be done with minimum disruption at a high quality, which we will need to be very, very much on top of. I mean, I think you're right. I mean, it, it, it is keeping on top of things. You know, certainly, the project is an excellent project. I mean, you know, you know, if we want to push productivity, which we've been talking about in the previous report, this is one of the key drivers for that. So, uh, thank you for that detailed report again. from GMCA, Fire and Rescue Service, and the 3.384 million capital from GMCA, um, Transfer Greater Manchester Urban Traffic Management Control. Note that the 21.3 million grant from DCMS LFFM is allocated between the districts and the GMCA to maximise full fibre site coverage across each district, and CA agreement will be sought to the final grant splits following the market response to the procurement. And finally, note, uh, which you've already mentioned to us, that the CCG assets are no longer part of the project, having secured fibre infrastructure via an alternative route. So if we could just note those three items, please. Thank you. So we're now on to item number nine, which is the local industrial strategy. Now, you, you, you only received these papers yesterday, um, late in the day, um, but we thought, it, and there was no way around it, basically. But we thought it was worthwhile to get it out to you now to have, a, if you like, a first look at. But it's, this is coming back to the next meeting. So there'll be, a, you know, an, obviously an opportunity to have proper scrutiny at the next meeting. Um, so, um, John Holden isn't here, so I, I, you're doing it, Simon. So over to you, Simon. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> um, just really wanted to use the opportunity. Obviously, the, the combined authority paper only came out yesterday. Uh, the launch of the uh, the independent prosperity review was was literally kind of just just before this meeting. I don't know a number number of people were were, were there at it, um, and but yet we have to agree a local industrial strategy, uh, or assuming we can agree what a local industrial strategy with government uh, before the end of March, um, uh, and therefore actually at our next meeting, uh, so it's going to be pretty pretty close up to the time at which we may be signing some kind of uh, local industrial strategy with government, and therefore wanted to really just bring some of the issues out to you at this meeting so. That you were aware of them um, and could give your views on them as we go into a, a period of time, which I'll explain um, um, in, in some discussions with, with government. Um, and as I say, a lot of these issues will be picked up at the Combined Authority next week as well. Um, I guess the, the the kind of the, the, the kind of just quickly going back through through a little bit of history. So obviously we've got the Greater Manchester strategy. That is the Great, Greater Manchester single uh, strategy for uh, how we're moving forward. Um, and we've got the um, future of Greater Manchester papers that were issued at the end of or well, sort of middle of January, which were beginning to set out some flesh on the bones of how we were beginning to take a number of issues forward and the interlinkages between a number of things that we talked about at that time, which were around you know the spatial framework. At Actually, but ensuring that we've got the right infrastructure in place, but actually ensuring that, that we're building the right houses in the right places, and ensuring, therefore, that we understand about where the industry of the future is lying in terms of, 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 of all those things linking together. Um, as part of the process of the local industrial strategy, we've talked before about the fact that uh, there's a national industrial strategy um, and government now wants every local area to produce a local industrial strategy, uh, uh, looking at how that local area's uh, industry is going to move forward uh, aligns to uh, the national industrial strategy. 
Um, and <coughs> that uh, uh, Greater Manchester is one of three trailblazer areas, so uh, we're, we're producing ours by the end of March, along with West Midlands and Oxford Cambridge uh, as a joint uh, um, local industrial strategy. So those are the three that are, are kind of testing the approach, as it were, um, with other areas to follow after that. Uniquely, this will be a um, uh, these industrial strategies will be a joint agreement between government and a local area, um, and uh, that actually gives us a real opportunity to set out very clearly a path with government of the, th the things that we think are important for the Greater Manchester economy over a period of time, and get government to, uh, to or government's agreement to those, and to work with us on those issues. As part of their, therefore, as part of that. Um, Industrial strategy, we were really keen to uh, do what we always do in Greater Manchester, which is to, to look at the evidence base um, and to put an evidenced case uh, to government. Um, and therefore, we've been doing this independent prosperity review over the last few months. It's 10 years on since we did the Manchester Independent Economic Review, um, and that was always seen as uh, the ev taking an evidence based approach working with government on that evidence and then you're not having arguments about the evidence you then may have differences of opinion about what you do about that evidence but actually you're all agreeing what the the key issues are um and and therefore how to to move forward um, we've done this evidence review, uh, or so we haven't. We, independent economists have done this evidence review on the Greater Manchester economy. Um, six uh, world-leading economists, uh, um, whose names are mentioned in the paper, won't go through them all, um, and they have now reported, um, launched it, as I earlier on today. Um, I just really want to give you a flavour of the kinds of things they were coming up with as being crucial to the Greater Manchester economy, and then look at how we will be moving forward with the industrial strategy uh, on, on the basis of that uh, review. Um, they, they have broadly said, um, and I'm, I'm, I am paraphrasing, I'm not going to quote directly from the report, but paraphrasing, they've said there are a number of areas where the Greater Manchester economy is really strong, um, and where actually we have some world-leading highlights that, or assets that sit within the Greater Manchester economy uh, that we need to make more of. Um, those assets uh, pr primarily are around advanced materials um, and health innovation um, as two key the major assets that, that, that are say, globally strong, where actually those can be used to drive UK economic growth as well as Greater Manchester economic growth. Um, but also that we have assets um, around our advanced manufacturing sector, uh, our digital and creative sector, our digital and tech sector particularly is, is very strong. Um, and uh, and actually also our uh, financial professional services sector is very strong. Um, and those are assets that we ought to be building on uh, for, for the future of Greater Manchester. Um, in terms of the uh, digital sector, they also talk about, um, uh, the, and I'll come on to this in a bit more detail, but they talk about the digital sector itself, the digital tech sector, but also about the, the adoption of digital technologies across all Greater Manchester companies as being important. So that's on, the, if you like, on the, the assets and opportunities that we have, uh, and what might be the kind of the uh, what is described in the technical term as frontier sectors, i.e., those sectors that are going to be at the uh, leading um, the, the 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 future growth. But what they also do is say, well, what are some of the issues and challenges that the Greater Manchester economy faces? Um, and they do a, they do a number of things. First of all, they say they, they say actually Greater Manchester has a has a fairly significant issue with the skills system, um, i.e. the skills system is not delivering the kind of skills that employers are going to need, and it's making or the the, the consequence of that is that uh, that, that individuals uh, are not. Uh, being able to access the opportunities that exist in the Greater Manchester economy, and they're not being able to, to, to progress and to, to uh, reach their, their full potential. Um, and employers, therefore, are uh, kind of suffering as a result of that as well. The second thing that they raise um, is, is, is in relation to health, uh, which is a new kind of finding. Um, we've always known that we have a, an issue with health in Greater Manchester, but what they say is that actually there is a, um, a, a kind of, or they, they quantify the economic impact of that is having on the Greater Manchester economy um, and actually saying both in terms of health keeping people out of work but also health uh, of, uh, um, of the people in work is actually a major significant barrier to the economy and we have to address health uh, in a different way if we're going to uh, uh, unlock the potential of the economy. The third area that they pull out um, which again We've, we've known about for some time, but they, they go into quite a lot of detail on, is what is, what is called the long tail of low productivity. Um, we have um, far too many companies who are trying to compete on the basis of a low added value, low wage, um, low innovation model, um, rather than on kind of high added value, higher wages, um, uh, and... Uh, 
and, and um, uh, kind of progression of individuals. Um, they talk about kind of some sectors where that's that's particularly prevalent, uh, and both within Greater Manchester and, and in the uh, uh, the UK as a whole. Actually, the proportion of the employment that is in those low productivity sectors is actually increasing rather than decreasing. So we have this issue with this long tail of low productivity, um, and actually within Greater Manchester, you could argue that some, something like eighty percent of the economy is in that long tail. So you've got some really significant um, economic drivers, but also you've got this kind of, uh, say, this kind of significant chunk of the economy that's in that, that uh, low tail. As part of that, they pull out the issues of skills utilisation. What they're saying is actually, yes, there is a problem with, this, with the supply of skills and the skills system isn't delivering the skills that, that the employers need, but actually also employers are not using those skills as effectively as they could do. Um, and that issue of skills utilisation is, is one of the cause, cause, causal factors uh, for the um, long term low productivity. Um, as, as part of that, um, they, uh, they, they, they talk about the issues of, of leadership and management and actually how can we uh, help companies think about their leadership and management to drive forward on, on, on the issues of, of, of uh, say, low, low productivity. Um, and, and, in, in, and specifically um, in, in that area, um, they, they are, uh, as I say, looking, looking at how we balance the, the, the kind of supply of skills and the, and the demand of four skills. The, third, the fourth area that they pull out is around infrastructure. And they broadly say that the infrastructure of Greater Manchester is a kind of Victorian infrastructure and we keep on trying to build on that. Actually, what we need to do is to create a 21st century infrastructure. Um, and they're not just talking about transport. Um, they're talking about uh, digital infrastructure. They're talking about the changing nature of our energy infrastructure that we will need to, uh, uh, to, to look at uh, as we move forward to um, uh, renewable energy, et cetera, et cetera. And so they, they pull out all of those uh, all of those issues. Um, that's that in itself is is kind of quite uh, significant. They make some very significant uh, recommendations about what Greater Manchester should do about that. Not all of those will be taken forward through the local industrial strategy because they are a wider set of implications, uh, both for the in industrial uh, uh, future of Greater Manchester, but also for the work that we're doing around public sector reform and and, and uh, delivery of di services in different ways uh, for uh, Greater Manchester residents. What we, uh, in terms of them moving forward into the industrial strategy, we need to recognise a number of things. Uh, we have to produce an industrial strategy, uh, ideally that we agree with government, uh, and that is the plan. Um, uh, the, that industrial strategy has to respond to uh, the grand challenges that the government has set out. Uh, those grand challenges are around uh, the future of mobility, it's around the future of clean growth, uh, they're around uh, artificial intelligence and data, um, and uh, ageing, uh, an ageing society and how we deal with all of those issues. They have to respond to the drivers of productivity that government has set out and they have to, uh, or the, the local industrial strategy is a framework for future UK Shared Prosperity Fund monies. UK Shared Prosperity Fund is the future replacement for ERDF and ESF, uh, sorry, European Regional Development Fund, European Social Fund monies. So we have to, and we've agreed this with government, we have to look at both sides of the economy. We have to look at both our assets, but also those things that are holding us back. And we have to talk about both of those in the local industrial strategy. Um, we are therefore working over the next few months, or sorry, next few weeks, shall I say, uh, to come up with a bold and ambitious uh, strategy for local industrial strategy for Greater Manchester, which we can agree with government. Um, and in the report, we talk about uh, the areas that that uh, industrial strategy is likely to focus on. We can't tell you for sure, um, but we, want, we know where we were trying to, trying to focus it. We want to focus it around those, those assets that we have. We want to drive, uh, sorry, we want, we want an industrial strategy that is um, holistic. So rather than looking at each individual issue in, in isolation, we actually want the combination of those issues to make sense when you add, add them all up, as it were, and look at the interrelationships between them all. So we definitely will talk about our strengths in advanced materials and advanced manufacturing. Uh, and we will definitely talk about our strengths in health innovation. One of the reasons uh, that we will talk about those issues, though, for example, is that actually we've got strengths in health innovation, but how do we use those strengths to actually address some of the health challenges that the conurbation faces and actually d uh, deliver health improvements uh, within our um, uh, within our conurbation and also think about the new products and services that Greater Manchester can be developing uh, as we move into an ageing society, different changing demands on, uh, on products and services, and how can Greater Manchester be at the forefront uh, of that? 
Similarly, in relation to uh, advanced materials, advanced manufacturing, and, and then leading on to the digital and tech industries, actually, if our um, advanced manufacturing sector, sorry, if our manufacturing sector is going to be at the heart of being an advanced manufacturing sector, actually that will require all of those companies uh, and, and all of our service companies as well to adopt modern methods of manufacturing, uh, actually adopting digital AI, um, artificial intelligence, sorry, uh, and, and, the, and the best use of data. And therefore, actually, our digital sector um, is in, if, if you like, supporting our advanced man materials and advanced manufacturing sector as well. Um, and then the final area we're likely to talk about is, is the whole issue of, of green industries. Um, partly that is about... Um, Recognising that actually, if we want you know the right homes in the right places, those homes need to be low carbon homes for the homes of the future, and therefore we need a strong digital. So we see these strong green industries, uh, low carbon industries, if we are going to capitalise on the opportunities that the, the kind of scale of building that we are going to see in Greater Manchester represents, but also that actually those green industries and our focus on green industries actually also represents a, a health issue. So actually, everybody having clean air to breathe um, and, and living in a clean and, uh, sorry, a strong uh, natural environment within Greater Manchester is going to be vital uh, for the health of the population. So those are some of the strengths that we want to pull out within uh, the industrial strategy. But we're also going to pull out uh, four kind of key uh, areas that we believe um, that we need to, to work with government on uh, moving forward. The first is very much our uh, skill system. Um, the, the review is very strong on saying that actually, um, you know, the, the system is fragmented. Uh, we have far too many people learning in institutions that are uh, poor, no, sorry, that are not good or outstanding, uh, as kind of offset rated, um, and that's institutions, both our kind of childcare institutions, our schools, and our colleges. And how do we work uh, to 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 change that? We have far too many people in the conurbation who don't have the kind of functional skills that employers need. Um, both in terms of young people, but also in terms of people in the workforce. Um, and we have far too many com people who are not progressing in work. Um, and that kind of, what, what kind of I think we're broadly going to call a skills accelerator, uh, is about actually how can you help people ex move forward in work uh, to, to es either to escape low pay uh, or to, to, be, to, to maximize their skills. And actually, if you can upskill people in work, you can then ensure people, other people can come into the workforce at, at lower skill levels, which is then building into our uh, issues of worklessness. Um, what, one of the issues that that, that, that Andy uh, has talked a lot, and Andy Burnham has talked a lot about, um, and and we know um, and recognise uh, in through this whole industrial strategy is that it must be an industrial strategy that is for all parts of Greater Manchester. This is not just about an industrial strategy that is about the kind of the shiny the shiny key sectors that, that, that quite often are concentrated in the, the centre of the conurbation. This is actually about how uh, all parts of the conurbation benefit from that. Um, and therefore, actually, the, the, the focus on skills is very, very deliberate. Um, because actually, if you, you know, and, and, and uh, Andy was talking at the um, launch of the, the, the review, he was talking actually about a visit he'd made to Oldham, and actually how, to, how can people across the conurbation actually recognise that the opportunities being created in the centre of the conurbation are, are opportunities that they can access and, and that it's not a, a different world to them. And we will definitely talk about that as part of the overall work on, on education and, and skills within the local industrial strategy. We want to be bold, uh, we want to be ambitious, and we want to, to, to propose to government that we actually look at the system as a whole uh, and Gemma and Matt have previously talked about the fact we spend, I think, £3.6 billion on that system as a whole every year in Greater Manchester. And how can you actually look at that as, as one rather than looking at it uh, in, a, in a kind of siloed way? The second thing that we want to be bold about is, is the infrastructure that we have in Greater Manchester. Um, we know that we don't have the right transport infrastructure. We know, as I said, that the review is telling us that we don't have the right uh, um, uh, rest of that, the physical infrastructure and also the right social infrastructure. And again, how can we have a, a different conversation with government about the totality of the infrastructure that Greater Manchester needs in order to achieve its growth ambitions and, importantly, how that how that infrastructure gets funded. Um, so we know that we're not going to get a blank check from government to say, yeah, here's your infrastructure need, there you go, go, go build it. Um, but actually, we do want a conversation with government about the way in which that infrastructure is funded um, over the long, longer time period and, and get a joint agreement with them about that. 
Um, the third area that we want to focus on uh, is very much around uh, uh, this issue of leadership and management within our companies. We think that unless you get that leadership and management in the companies right, we are not going to drive forward on productivity. We're not going to be see the right kind of skills utilisation. And actually, the good employment charter that you were talking about earlier is, is a really good example, actually, where we can help and encourage companies to think about the use of their workforce, how, the, how they're using the skills in their workforce to drive their own productivity and, and move forward. And then the fi final area, which um, in, the, in the CA report is, is kind of pulled out as a separate area, um, in, in, which is about place within Greater Manchester, i.e. ensuring this delivers for the whole of the conurbation. I actually, um, this may just be a personal view at the moment, but I think we need to weave that through the whole story that we're telling rather than pulling it out as a separate aspect of the, uh, of the report. So, for example, as I say, you know, both about infrastructure, about education, about the, kind of the way that health innovation can be used, uh, the way in which our green industries can be, can be driven forward across the conurbation as a whole. I think actually we just need to tell the, the place story and, and tell that kind of really clear, clear articulation of how this is a a strategy for all parts of the conurbation rather than uh, kind of having that as a separate chapter. Um, I'm going to stop there broadly other than to say we've had uh, some pretty positive conversations with government so far about our emerging industrial strategy. Um, they absolutely get the evidence base and they are delighted with the evidence base so much so in fact that we're running a session with Treasury about the evidence base and how we've done it and how other areas might be able to learn from the way we've done it. Um, and we are in a very active dialogue with them about all the issues that I've talked about. Um, there's going to be some pretty hard uh, negotiations and conversations that we need to have if we are to land an industrial strategy in Greater Manchester that genuinely sets up for a different conversation with government and a different approach to some of these really long-standing issues uh, and where we can use our assets for the benefit of Greater Manchester but also for, the, for, for driving UK economic growth and genuinely put Greater Manchester at the heart of uh, the, the second growth pole in, in the country as a whole. So lots of detailed conversations to be had. Um, those will all conclude by the end of March, and therefore at your next meeting, uh, I will be hoping to, to bring you up to speed with where those negotiations have got to uh, and to seek your endorsement for some, uh, hopefully, some bold and radical new arrangements with the government. Given the fact that's so fresh, Sam, that's, that's a fantastic, comprehensive, if you like, report. So um, before I throw it out, just to, to emphasise that we will have another opportunity, because I know you've only just received these, these, um, these papers, but in the meantime, Whatever question you want to ask, you can do. Um, we've got Kate, then we've got Luke, and then we've got Mark. Thank you, Chair. Um, oh, sorry, and then if, Valerie. I'll be honest, I haven't read every page in detail, but I have had a, <laughs> a good scan. Um, and y nothing has been mentioned about banking at all. And I know from conversations elsewhere about the issues that uh, business is having, partic particularly SMEs, around getting, uh, the, being able to get loans for investment. So you talked about their um, lack of innovation, but surely some of that lack of innovation is through the n not being able to get loans. And it would just be nice to have some reference in here to what we're going to do about that, what influence we can have on the banks. I know there's also been discussion in GM around having our own GM bank that may address some of those issues. I just feel it should be in there somewhere, if you could comment. There are two issues that I to pick up related to that. One is um, how we describe the financial and professional services sector, um, because uh, the reviewers report say it's actually a very strong sector within Greater Manchester, and we need to uh, kind of build on that strength. Um, one of the things that we do want to do, and we'll talk about more in the full industrial strategy, is the way in which that sector is evolving and changing within Greater Manchester, uh, particularly in relation to things like e-commerce and cyber security and uh, fintech as well. So actually, it's a very much an emerging sector, or sorry, evolving sector, um, and we need to just kind of capture that appropriately within the industrial strategy. Um, I, I apologise, I have paraphrased slightly in, in relation to the whole issue of kind of business support, for want of a better word. How do we encourage our companies to become more productive? Uh, uh, there are a number of things that, that, that we, the report uh, talked about and we will talk about in the industrial strategy. Uh, yes, it's about leadership and management. Yes, it's about innovation adoption. So it's not about every company being the most innovative. It's about them uh, just uh, adopting those, the most innovative technologies in their 
company. Um, we talk about you know exposure to international competition because that genuinely, genuinely, generally makes companies more productive. And we will talk about access to finance and the barrier that access to finance represents to companies being able to to grow. Um, so that whole issue of, of loans for investment um, and access to finance will be covered in the uh, in the industrial strategy. Luke. Uh, thank you. No, this is great. I haven't read it all myself either, a couple of key sections, but I think the first point is that we're really lucky as a committee to have such a strong evidence base to draw on with the work that we do going forward, and it's a, probably a question for us about how we refer back to this on an ongoing basis. This, for me, is, is potentially of quite long-term significance to, to, to this committee, so we, I suppose we can have a discussion about that. I was particularly um, well, excited, I suppose, really keen to see... Um, quite new areas of, of policy included within an economic context, so mental and physical health highlighted uh, by the reviewers um, today in, in the session um, earlier, um, and also within the report, of course. Um, and I think some of the messages that came out today were also about sort of inclusive, we're not relying on sort of trickle-down that came across quite strongly today from the, from the reviewers, from, from Henry Overman and others as well. Um, and I think that's possibly something that we've, we've always said at this committee, and we've said it in the scrutiny at Manchester as well. We, the idea of trickle down, we just can't even entertain it anymore. It's, it's not really ever worked for the city and hasn't worked for many other cities. Um, so we absolutely need to be looking at what interventions we're going to do at the, with that long tail, as you mentioned, um, and with inclusive growth for its own sake at, at the bottom, bottom end as well. The other challenge was around integration and devolution as related to that. And I think, again, that's something where Great Manchester needs to perhaps challenge itself about delivering on the promise of devolution to actually integrate policy across areas, whether that's transport and skills and so on. And we found that not to be the case in the past. I think it's coming together, um, particularly with the 2040 strategy and the spatial framework starting to align earlier this month. So um, loads of really interesting stuff there and something I think for this committee to, to take forward. My question's to you, though. Sorry for the speech. I'm not usually one to do that. Um, the complexity section was the one that um, I, I read because it's got a really interesting math. It's towards the end. Um, I'd not seen that data before. It's obviously something that um, in, in my day job I do quite a lot of, of, of economic analysis and so on. Um, I think I understand it. <laughs> um, I'd, I'd hope to understand more of it. I think it would be really useful to unpack it quite a bit because, um, you know, well, if I'm right, it seems to suggest that different parts of the city region have different levels of complexity. Um, the, the relevance of that, I'd, I'd be interested to know what messages is going forward from that into the local industrial strategy and how, um, again, what you were saying, how different strengths of different parts of the city region can be brought out. Um, and finally, the SPF, I suppose, for me, um, when, when we talk to, to government, we're not quite clear on the basis of our SPF will be distributed. I don't know if, if you're clearer than we are, um, but um, it's, it's quite... It, well, obviously, SPF is to replace European structural funding. Um, that used to go to areas that had particularly low GDP per capita, um, and that's you know, perhaps Merseyside. And, and if, if we look forward at the map of, of areas that will be set to receive that funding going forward, um, we see areas like South Yorkshire, parts of Wales still, and parts of, um, parts of Cornwall, I believe, still being within the scope of what would what we would have got if we were to remain within the EU. Um, I guess that leaves an open question about how its replacement will be um, distributed, um, whether it will be on in terms of poorer areas, for want of a better word, or you know, areas with less GDP per capita, or whether it will be you know, more, where you can get more bang for your buck. Uh, it seems to be what you're suggesting is where you get more bang for your buck, as in the local industrial strategy will be a basis for that. Um, but have you got any clarity on that question? Thank you. Uh, thanks for that. Just a couple of points on on your your kind of early points, as it were, in terms of the you know one one of the reasons we've done this independent economic review, uh, or it's been done to us or, or for us, as it were, um, is you know, the Manchester Independent Economic Review ten years ago was the basis on which we had all those conversations with the government, which ultimately led to the first devolution deal and that that ability to go into government and say it, it, we kind of take take the evidence out of the argument because we've got a solid evidence base, we've worked with government on that, um, and they understand and agree with that evidence base. You can then argue about the, the policy response, but you're not arguing about the issues. Um, and that's why we were so keen to update it 10 years on. We felt it was the right time to, to do this. And, and genuinely, it, it, it is a prosperity review. So it is, it, its scope is wider than the independent economic review that, that was done 10 years ago. So um, that, that's, uh, you know, we're really pleased with what the reviewers have done for us. I think the... Um, I do think that things are beginning to come together in terms of like, the future of Greater Manchester paper began to pull that, you know, say that kind of uh, spatial framework and, and transport plan, et cetera, together. So uh, I think that that is absolutely beginning to come together. We need to do more. Um, and actually what I was trying to say in the 
uh, industrial strategy is that actually we need to tell that, that integrated story. So it's not about this sector separately from that sector or separately from that issue. It's actually about how that how the whole of that comes comes together. In terms of the um, complexity data, I think it, it, you know if you if you want, um, it maybe will be that we would want to have a separate. Uh, or either separate session or, or even a, a presentation on that complexity data at, at this uh, at a future meeting of this uh, group. Um, the, uh, the the kind of short answer to the question is that um, actually well, it looks at the interrelationships that need to happen uh, within a place uh, in order to make that or to, to build on the strengths of that place. Um, so it's actually saying you couldn't necessarily land uh, an, an advanced um, uh, biotech company in any part of the conurbation because actually the inter the interrelationships and interactions don't exist in that place. But each place has got different sets of interactions, interrelationships, and we need to build those over a period of time building on the strengths that places do have to, to, to make those interactions and inter interdependencies uh, greater and deeper, as it were. Um, and that's what the complexity data is doing. The full report, it won't be out for, for, for a month or so. Um, and that, I think probably after that, it would be worthwhile uh, then, then coming back to that data. Um, Can I just jump in? I think it would be a really good idea to come back to us, actually. Yep. Because yep. uh, that is one of the more novel parts of the, the analysis that, that's been done. Um, so it, it is about um, building on... Uh, uh, kind of you know, building on, on every area's strengths, and those are different. Um, but actually, it's, it's also about releasing releasing the potential of everybody in terms of the enabling everybody to have the infrastructure and the, the skills provision that they need in order to access the opportunities anywhere in the conurbation. In terms of the UK Share Prosperity Fund, um, we don't know which basis it's going to be. Uh, uh, de, de, um, uh, issued at all. We don't know whether it's going to focus on, on opportunities or on need. Um, all of that is still, there's going to be a consultation, uh, long, a long-awaited consultation the government promised me only yesterday will be, uh, will be out shortly. Um, but we felt, and, and government agree with this, that our industrial strategy needs to cover the totality of what we need to do, um, and then we can almost play to play to however the industrial strategy, sorry, the, to however the UK Ship Prosperity Fund uh, uh, lands. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, a couple of points. Firstly, uh, given the fact we've not had, I appreciate this is first pass on this, so um, there'll be other opportunities as well. But I, I think, uh, considering we didn't have a great deal of time to read and inwardly digest the content, uh, Simon's comprehensive and detailed introduction, even by his own fair <laughs> standards, uh, was beneficial um, uh, for all of us. Um, I, what surprised me about it is it's always easier to find things that are not there, isn't it, rather than the stuff that's there. And clearly, this is a major piece of work, and a lot of hours and you know uh, have gone into uh, getting it to the stage where we're at now. But the, the the thing that surprised me was the lack of emphasis, if I might say so, um, on the transport side of things. I know it mentioned in passing a couple of times, but it seems to me axiomatic that any economic or industrial plan that we're going to worth its salt needs to have an integrated transport solution as part of it. Um, we are here in Greater Manchester, one of the most congested parts of the country. Um, you know, there is work going on. The mayor is keen to tell us about the work that needs to be done on clean air. The leader of our council in Stockport um, is the lead member for that. So I know that there is a lot of work going on, but there is nothing much in here, as it stands, um, about the need for an integrated transport solution. Um, you know, I, and by that I don't just mean, I'm not making purely a parochial point, although as Stockport I think is still just about the only area that Metrolink doesn't extend to, I, I won't miss the opportunity to say that, but the whole thing about clean air, proper integrated public transport, having a plan for that, I think underpins um, a lot of what the industrial strategy, if I'm understanding it right, it is about. And I'd just like Simon to comment on, on that. And perhaps also what the, the next stage is in terms of a delivery plan, because it's great to have this overarching strategy, but in words of one syllable, we need to know what the next steps are in terms of how it's going to be delivered and perhaps roughly over what period of time. Thanks, Chair. So, so the issue of uh, uh, an integrated transport solution is absolutely, absolutely at the heart of uh, the, 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 both the reviewer's report and actually the, the local industrial strategy. Uh, the, the phrasing that we're using is in, in relation to the 
to the paragraphs around updating our physical and social infrastructure. Um, so actually we're talking about an integrated infrastructure solution for Greater Manchester, recognising that actually it's not just about transport, it's far wider than that, it's about digital infrastructure, it's about energy infrastructure, it's about our, our all over our utilities infrastructure as well. So uh, it is absolutely a key finding of the reviewer's report that the transport infrastructure as well as all for other forms of infrastructure are not uh, at the level they need to be, and that what we need is, a, is an integrated infrastructure plan for Greater Manchester, and that includes transport, um, uh, rather than just pulling out transport on its own. Um, we obviously launched the Greater Manchester um, Infrastructure Framework, as, uh, the January Combined Authority meeting, which we talked about previously, oh, sorry, the, the, the Planning and Housing Scrutiny Committee have talked about previously, but that, that, that integrated um, infrastructure framework now exists and effectively what we're, what the reviewers are saying is you need to you need you need, you need a decent infrastructure plan including transport because it's not working for you at the moment uh, and you need a you need a way of funding the level of infrastructure investment that's going to be needed in order to meet your growth ambitions and that includes transport um, and that's exactly what we will be reflecting back to government that we need to so say we need to agree a plan with the government and we need to agree how that plan could be financed Valerie, I'm going to have this as the last question because we've obviously it's coming back again next month and I'm conscious we've got one more item on the agenda to go through and that's all I'm going to do is make one observation actually. I'm not noted for long speeches. I wanted to point out paragraph 4.5 at the end and the implication of some of the conclusions of the analysis which point to stronger devolution an argument that we presumably will have with, with central government, the need for more stronger place-based work, and obviously then the, the implications of the complexity analysis, and I, I, would, I look forward to more discussion about, about that. But the language in paragraph 4.5 suggests that you will develop, you will develop with central government the local industrial strategy. And then each local authority within Greater Manchester area will respond to that. I would hope <laughs> that, that each local authority has been involved in the development of the Greater Manchester industrial strategy. And that's more and more critically important if the analysis is telling us, pointing us in the direction of more devolution. Yep, uh, that, that's a language, uh, or badly, badly worded uh, paragraph eff effectively. So th th there's two things that are going to happen. Uh, one is that uh, all, the, all the leaders uh, and all the chief executives and all of the directors of place are fully involved in the development of the industrial strategy. Um, there's going to be con conversations next week um, uh, with all of those groups about the evolving industrial strategy. So every district is fully involved, and we have done quite a substantial amount of consultation with, and, and, and joint work with all of the districts about the assets and opportunities and how those are reflected within the uh, industrial strategy. So the, that, that's going to kind of reassure you on that point. Um, the the, the purpose of that paragraph was to say, actually, once we have got that joint agreement with government, it may well be useful for each local authority to, to kind of think about their response to that, i.e. how, how the, the, they work with that document uh, in, in their locality, because it will vary from locality to locality, but they will have been fully involved in, in, in the development of that. Um, and the, the only other point, I just going to ask Mark's question about implementation, uh, whether there will be an implementation, so the, the, by, by the end of March, we need to reach a headline agreement with government on the key issues that we want to work with with, there will then be an implementation plan developed as part of that. Valerie, that was a very well-made point, actually. And I think you've got quite a lot of heads nodding around the place, actually. That's all I want to mention, Simon. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a thorough report. It's great it's evidence-based, and that's the way to take these things forward. The, the, the two things that depress me with this report, and you've already touched on them. One is skills. I can remember when I first became a councillor 13 years ago, that was one of our biggest issues within in Rochdale. And secondly, when I was on the board of the Pen and Acute Trust, the, the um, Audit Commission produced, and this must be a, a, 10 years ago, an absolutely superb report about health inequality, superb but, but damning report on health inequalities in, in, uh, in Greater Manchester. And we've still got those issues now. So, I mean, not for common now, Simon, but it's, it's something that we need to understand.
better going forward. How on earth, if we couldn't resolve them before, when we knew there was an issue there, how were we going to resolve them this time? And I think that would be, be possibly a separate debate we could have you know, at the next meeting. But I do thank you, actually, for a very detailed expose of a report that's, on, that's only just come out, actually. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of debate at, at the next meeting. So thank you. So I think we just... We're now on to the final report, I'm so, and I'm sorry to keep you waiting. Um, but this is obviously on the, an update on the, the work and skills update. But bearing in mind what the time is, can I make a suggestion that, that um, let's assume that everybody's read the report and therefore possibly, I mean, just give two minutes quick overview and then we'll, we'll, we'll obviously raise questions with you. Is that, is that okay with you? Um, yeah, sure. that's, that's fine, Chair. I mean, it, it's a funny old report, this one, isn't it? it? It covers a whole range of things, and much of the items that it gives an update on come as separate reports yeah. at other times in the meeting Indeed. where you can go into them in more depth. Um, there were a few things that I just wanted to draw uh, members' attention to where, within the report, um, but I acknowledge that this is scrutiny and the things that I might want to highlight are not necessarily the things that you might want to highlight. Um, so I'm pleased to report that there's nothing that's got red against it in this, although my copy is black and white, but I'm confident I can say that with some confidence. Um, so something that I wanted to highlight was the, uh, the first one under priority one, the careers and employability um, element. Uh, Greater Manchester has been awarded half a million pounds to be one of 20 careers hubs, and this is something that... Um, it is really um, struck a chord with me as uh, when I went out to visit our youth zone in Oldham um, with the chief executive and one of the questions that one of the young people asked us there was can you get me a job on the bins um, and he worked on it, he lived in quite a remote council estate that was built in the 60s I don't know why we ever did that building council estates out in the sticks um, but the reason that he asked for a job on the bins was because the only experience of people working was when the bin men came around on a Thursday. And so the work that we're doing around careers in Greater Manchester in comparison to the way it's delivered in other parts of the country is really important in improving young people's line of sight because quite simply, uh, lots of young people don't apply for a range of roles because they don't know that they exist. And anything that we can do locally with this funding um, is important in addressing that. So Bridge GM is in 164 of our Greater Manchester schools so far and um, it will mean a meaningful encounter with business or enterprise. So now that um, work experience isn't a statutory requirement of schools, uh, we're doing something that can hopefully pick up the slack where schools haven't got the capacity to do something that they no longer have to do. Um, and we can do it to some degree of quality. Uh, again, if I think about my own experience of work experience when I was at school, um, there were many people that were academic that were just placed um, in placements with their parents because it was easy to send them to work with their mum um, or placed filling cell shelves for free in, in department stores when really they wanted to be doctors or engineers or a whole range of different things. So we're trying to do something that's really quite meaningful. Um, on the second page under priority two, we have the skills advisory panel, which is something that uh, we, were, we were encouraged to set up in Greater Manchester. We've done a slightly different model, and we have the ESAP rather than the SAP, which is the Employment and Skills Advisory Panel. Uh, something that we do differently here, which is really worth highlighting, <coughs> is that around the table we have Director Generals of the Department for Work and Pensions, the Department for Education, and only because on the day of the first meeting, um, the de uh, DG from the Department of Culture and Media and Sport happened to be in Greater Manchester. They came along as well, um, but they are indicating that they wish to remain on this board and as a result of that well I like to think this is a result of that meeting but we got 20 million pounds worth of funding out of the DCMS in the budget and um, so I like to think that I made a good impression on this person that wasn't ha wasn't meant to come. <coughs> um, AEB devolution is moving along uh, 36 providers have been successful in progressing to the next stage of procurement uh, what AB devolution means is that we will work with a smaller number of providers and we can really start to tailor the offer in Greater Manchester and manage quality in a way that I don't believe it could have been done nationally. So that there were some providers that were disappointed, as you'd expect, because we've gone from a larger number down to 36, but I do think that we've got the balance right in terms of quality and delivering on our priorities in Greater Manchester. Um, what else did I want to talk about? Uh, Skills capital, I think it's worth saying something briefly about that. Uh, we had a report about that at the previous scrutiny meeting. Um, the funding applications from Bolton and Wigan and Lee will be coming to the combined authority um, for approval in principle in February of this month. Um, and the application, round two application from Oldham, will be coming in March also. 
Um, I talk in Oldham about how many of our talented people that do well in our quality schools that we don't tell enough people about um, never return. They go away and do well at university and don't come back. Um, some, a story that we have in here is around graduate retention, which comes at it from a different angle, but retention of graduates who come here to study in Greater Manchester is up compared to previous years, so we're an attractive place for talented people to stay long after they've finished, finished studying. Um, under welfare reform, uh, there have been visits to Northern Ireland and Scotland who have devolved arrangements for welfare provision, which we are looking to mirror here in Greater Manchester to help some of, uh, of those of our more vulnerable residents on welfare, and that looks very promising. And finally, the last thing I wanted to highlight was under Working Well, um, the latest annual report shows that 17,000 Greater Manchester residents who are hard to reach uh, have been assisted through Working Well, and 3,500 have moved on to employment through the support that they received through that programme. So there is plenty more in here, which is good news, but I just thought that those were some of the things that were worth talking about. Mm, thank you. I particularly appreciated the part of the report on working well, not largely because I'm going back to my process kinds of questions, I'm afraid. We have a much clearer idea of an outcome of this program with the data that's presented here. In many other parts of the, the report point to lots of progress, but lots of progress in activities and funding rather than outcome. Right. And I realize that in some places it's not possible to point to outcomes yet, but I hope that will become a more prominent part of the reporting to us. <coughs> to add to that, I mean, one of the things I was going to ask, actually, that I think in um, on secondary school performance, it, a, a final report was available, and that's an output. I was just wondering if, if the exact summary of that could, could, be, could be circulated to us. Well, this is, this is uh, on page 28, priority four, second item. So I, I think where there's information like that, which we should look, which is you know it's referred to in the report. I don't want loads and loads of detail, but, but just an exact summary could be quite helpful. Because I think Valerie makes a very important point: outputs, you know, are you no know, other thing to measure going forwards. And I think to have some in, in idea of what is happening in in those uh, those key areas where inputs are important and are valuable, that I think that would be that would be quite helpful. What I'll do, rather than mention any others, I've got a couple of others. I'll send you an email. Yeah. Of, the, of the things which, or you, what your colleagues, I sh should say, sir. Okay. Uh, yes, Valerie. Um, no, that's useful feedback. Um, where possible, we will endeavour to include outcomes in as much. Um, it's not always possible, and of course, many of these items that are covered in this report come as standalone reports themselves. That this committee is well aware. There's more detail and, and outcomes contained in those, but I will uh, feed back to the team and ensure that we do uh, as much as we can for future versions of this. Um, I was going to say, on, oh, um, priority one on the, the last paragraph of it, you've got this um, 105 enterprise advisors have been matched. Um, our ambition is to match 180 schools and colleges with enterprise by December 2018. Is that, is that a typo? Uh, Simon, are you able to? So you're absolutely right. Um, I think the other question, one of the other questions that was raised around us, our ambition, and, and we had hoped to get 180 secondary schools and colleges involved and then match them to an enterprise advisor. And I think it's key that we understand the role of the enterprise advisor as a volunteer from business who devotes about a day a month to working with that school on a strategic careers plan. Um, but it's all about sequencing. So in order, every 20 schools and colleges that we um, engage with has a level of coordination and we've been recruiting those coordinators to do that. And so there's been some delays in that recruitment, partly because they're match funded um, locally, but also from a national pot. So we've just had to sort of work through that sequencing. Once you appoint the coordinator, you get your 20 schools. As we've increased our numbers, it's obvious that we're now getting to some of those harder to engage schools and colleges, so that's taking a bit longer. And we're working locally with our partners, our local authorities, to um, get to that point. And then once you get to know the school and their needs, you can identify which of the enterprise advisor, that business volunteer you need, 
to work with them. And that takes quite a while. So we've got a lot in the pipeline. We're not where we would like to be, but we've got a number of now very strategic focus, focal points really to, to get those enterprise advisors. And the team is under no illusion that we need to be there by, um, by March really now and, and get that working. Um, nationally, the expectation from the career strategy is that every school has one of those enterprise advisors by 2020. So, so we are ahead of the curve there um, on that, and I think that the progress is good. And, and the other significant piece on the enterprise advisor, just for your information, is nationally those enterprise advisors have been working with all schools across the country on, on, on what we've got are some good careers benchmarks. And benchmarks five and six are around volunteers and bringing more businesses into the school. So you'll see in the report that many of our young people are getting different types of encounters with employers. Um, and so they use that, that advisor brings their network of employers to that school or college and gives those young people those experiences. So nationally, they've been working on that really hard, but they've been, been ignoring all the other benchmarks for good quality careers guidance, but we haven't done that. We've worked on all eight. So that just puts us a little bit behind, but we will eventually, I think, prevail and have a model. And as Councillor uh, Fielding said, the hub element of that um, is a recognition really that nationally we've got quite an innovative model across Greater Manchester. Um, so I'm pretty sure that we'll have a sustainable um, development and schools and colleges will sustain this for themselves beyond 2020, which I think other areas will find that they're lacking. Can, can, I, just add, can I just add to that? I mean, I was asked a similar question actually. And you, you know, I just think this British program is fantastic. And but my question would have been, because I didn't know what the, steel, the figures were, is, is the actual programme ambitious enough? Because, I mean, the, the, you know, that is, really is the way forward to get children, particularly from, from you know, if you like, poor backgrounds, to be able to realise what their full potential is, you know, to, to understand what, what the opportunities in this life are. Think, so the actual project, I think, is brilliant. And the, and the more we can do about it, the better, really. Um, it's a very ambitious um, programme. I think we've made it more ambitious because of concentrating on those internationally um, recognised benchmarks for good careers guidance, and we've worked through that. We're at, we want to get to all schools and colleges, 230 by 2020, so, so there'll be some um, plans now to look at how we uh, uplift on, on some of that work, and it requires more coordination. But I think the bit that will make our work even more ambitious, and it's something we're going to pilot through the hub, which is 36 schools and colleges really accelerating their practice, bringing together what we've kind of coined as a pan-GM model for improvement around um, careers education, with some demonstrable uh, evidence on impact, which I think is what we were saying, or you were saying earlier, is, well, so what? You're doing all this, what's the difference? So we need to demonstrate some of that. Um, the ambition will be the differentiation. So rather than this tick, it's not a tick box exercise by any means. And my coordinators are really good at challenging and the enterprise advisor challenges back at the school. We insist that the senior leaders are in that school or college when this happens. So it's not just coordination is to start looking at, well, all right, what does this now mean for looked after children? What does this mean for your special educational needs children? Should we be looking at two encounters, three encounters per year for those young people? Are we coordinating careers with the lead for special needs and for um, looked after children? And when you start looking at that model around that young person and it becomes about their journey in that line of sight, we are ambitious. And I think there's no, probably nowhere else that's doing it in that way. I've only got another two pages of questions. No, 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 if, 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 if you've got more to come back on, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I'll, I'll only keep you another hour. Um, actually, yeah, well, you answered the question, on, on the third question was, uh, there was no mention of, of care leavers in, in the report, and, and I think we, well, we, no, we more or less picked that up with in your response, didn't we, that, even though it's not mentioned, but it is important. We talk about BAM, BAMEs, but we don't talk about care, care leavers, which I think, and very, very, I mean, we're quite, to keen on that sort of thing. So that's something maybe in the report put a bit more emphasis. And, and then uh, I was going to talk about the, because um, some of your, your figures there, Sean, I mean, in terms of the 15,600 achievements, etc. Mm -hmm. to go back to Valerie's point, a bit more um, um, 
numerical detail would be helpful. In other words, there was 50... Well, it's, it's 15,000 were achievements, but how many started and how many dropped out? Um, you know, so because you're saying there's a... I can't remember now how many starters there were this year, but it will understand the percentage of the 15,000, how many fell out, how many we're going to get... Uh, as, you know, in terms of that, so it's in in the next in the report. If we can have more depth in the um, in, in the calculate you know, in the in the breakdown of the figures, that would be. Sorry, I can't read the email. Sorry. Thanks, Chair. It, I think it really goes back to when you talk about enterprise advisor networks and, and what you said about the bin men and so on. I just, just, you know, from personal experience, lifetime experience really, when, you, when you're sort of 16, if your parents are professionals, then they know other professionals and they know, they know how, the, how the world works really, they understand the expertise and they can give you guidance. If you come from the background where your parents don't have that expertise and you know the, your ambition is the only person you see working is the bin men, then you're at a severe disadvantage really. And I just wonder whether, we, whether the advisors, whether there's any sort of mentor system where people, can, in, in, not replace the parents, but you know what I mean, can provide the expertise that more professional people have to get, give guidance to kids who could go on to be lawyers and, and engineers and so on, but just don't have the people who say, you can do this, and this is how you do it, and I know people who can help you or how to get you into the system, because kids from that background are, are disadvantaged because they, you know, they just don't have any contact with professional level people. I think that's, that's certainly the intention of the programme because that is an acknowledged gap um, in Greater Manchester. You know, I visit schools as part of my role, and you ask children what they want to do, and it's whatever their dad wants to do quite often. Um, I, I wanted to be a bus driver until I was about nine years old, but that's what my dad did. So, uh, no, I acknowledge that, and that's certainly the, um, th that's the ambition of the programme, so that is picked up as part of what Bridge GM is all about, Barry. Thank you. Yeah, just a quick one. Um, in terms of those numbers of um, schools, does it include pupil referral units? And is there any intention to work with primary schools? I know instinctively we don't think about primary schools in terms of careers guidance, but I know from uh, those I've spoken to who work in primary schools, they often get frustrated about being left out of this kind of thing. So any thoughts about primary schools and obviously pupil referral units? Um, the, the figure in the paper does refer uh, does include pupil referral units. It doesn't include primary schools, obviously, because I mean there's loads of those, aren't there? Um, but there is an intention to to work with primary schools because careers from a an earlier the earlier we can start giving careers advice and what kind of path you need to set yourself on, um, the better, really. So there is an intention to do that. Uh, thank you. Um, so my first point is um, that at the launch earlier today, someone. Um, made a point which for me was actually not too welcome and it was it essentially said that all you need is aspiration I think that's not what you've said today and that's not what any of us would agree with but I think we've got to be very careful about how we talk about ambition and aspiration because actually the, the real problem here is some deep structural problems in our economy and our labour market and they're not going to be wished away by young people just being more ambitious mm -hmm. not that anyone would suggest that but I think just sometimes you have to be very careful that we focus on the, the real problems here that are really difficult but that's where the focus should be that is where the focus is within this, this programme of course 
Um, just reflecting on the program as a whole, it's all very supply side focused, of course. I mean, that's what you'd expect. But if, as I think we all do, if you share the view that Greater Manchester is at this low skill equilibrium point, then at some point we have to ask the demand side question. Um, that again came up today. Um, and I wonder, I suppose, the link between the skills stuff and the prosperity review and the local industrial strategy is, is extremely important. Uh, and I just hope, I suppose it's a hope, will there be something potentially quite interventionist and radical on the demand side? And it's difficult stuff, I appreciate. It's not the natural home for industrial strategy. It's not a natural home for Greater Manchester. But that is really where the problem is, and that's, it's a difficult question to answer. But are we at least asking those questions around the demand side? It's possibly a question for Simon as well, as Sean. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, absolutely, and as you say, that's one of the key messages of the Prosperity Review, and, and, and therefore that we, we absolutely will focus on things around leadership and management, about skills progression within companies, about workforce development, uh, the work, quite a lot of the work of the growth companies is, is, is in that space, um, but as a kind of almost the, the good employment charter is, is, is potentially one of the ways in which we can encourage companies to think about their own workforce and, and, and actually drive productivity through, through upskilling, effectively. So it it is an area we need to do far more work on, and it's recognised by that in the Prosperity Review, uh, and we will definitely focus on that in the, uh, in the um, industrial strategy. Right, well, I've, I've noticed we're now not quarried anymore by, by one. I'm sorry that we've, we've got on for, for a while past that normal day, but there's been some interesting discussions. Oh, Simon, go on. Just, just two points I wanted to, to, to flag with you as, as, uh, in the report, um, which haven't so far been mentioned. One, one is on uh, adult education budget. Uh, as part of the proposals around the adult education budget, we are going to be setting up local governance meetings. Uh, what that means is that for every district, we will be having a meeting between the providers in that district and ourselves, with, who are the kind of contract holders, effectively, to look at the impacts on that district. Um, and the second thing I wanted to mention just was on on, on European Social Fund, uh, we are going to be putting in uh, another substantial European Social Fund bid where we effectively, we get the money to, at a Greater Manchester level, before the 29th of March, yeah, so we get the money at Greater Manchester level and then contract that out as part of that overall working skills strategy under our co-financing arrangements. Sorry, thank, thank you for those updates. So, th thank you for your attendance, thank you for, for your excellent question, which is why we were obviously overrun. And uh, I think the thing to take away on, on this particular report, Sean, is really a, a bit more you know, detail in terms of outputs and, and quantification of items. But things are moving in the right direction, which is good. Ha, ha, all of you have a lovely weekend.